morning and welcome back to the 2024 Bureau of the Census Scientific Advisor Committee Spring Meeting. Before we begin, I'd like to say some expressions of thanks. Uh, sometimes we do it at the ending, but I'd like to do it at the beginning just to be sure everyone is still here and people aren't brushing off to catch a plane or something. Three categories, members of the advisory branch for their work in organizing this meeting. All that goes on, too much to list, but members are aware. All the supporting Census Bureau offices that make this meeting a success, and the staff of the U.S. Uh, Patent and Trademark Office, for, especially for the technology. A second category, <coughs> members of the Bureau of the Census Scientific Advisor Committee, and our and Census Bureau presenters for all of the work that you actually do behind the scenes. Uh, having been a member of myself many years ago, I, I understand what goes on, but I think much more seems to go on now than, than at that time. But sincere thanks for all the time that you invested in, in what you have done. And finally, uh, to our committee chair, uh, Jay, I, I want to say, I know we recognized you yesterday, but I want to say that uh, on behalf of the Census Bureau, I think I can speak, you have raised the bar for our leadership for this committee. So sincere thanks. It's now time for who said that. This is our way of reflecting on the previous day's activities. It's a game, in fact, it's the longest running game of its type uh, that, that, that I'm aware of for our federal government advisory committees. There are no winners, no losers, but you get some inner satisfaction. I know at least one member here who reported one time that she had a perfect score. Tori, do you remember that? You remember reporting a perfect score on this uh, on the, for many years in the past? <laughs> I know. <laughs> so people do pay attention. Let's get started. Um, Who's? Yes. Yes, I can. All right. No. We're back. One more. Okay. We're almost back.
All right, we'll, we'll proceed. Just who said that? The Census Bureau is retaining and not changing the disability question on the American Community Survey for 2025. Yes. <laughs> who said that? Who, who said that? Who said that? Be vigilant about making faster horses, which is allegedly what Henry Ford said his customers would have requested if he asked people what they wanted. Yes. Consider saying managing statistics, statistical products rather than managing statistics. Who said that? Okay. These, these are, okay, there's a little randomization in here, by the way. I, I think John, John detected a pattern that I used several meetings ago and uh, ex exposed what I was doing, so I tried to make it a little bit more challenging. I'm a little concerned about the complete elimination of field work in address updating. Who said that? Yes. How do we understand and try to address the great diversity among the AIAN tribal communities? Yes. <laughs> yes, you said Yes, you said you said that. Frames are valuable individually, even more valuable when linked. Yes, yes. The Census Bureau's FY 2024 budget is over $102 million less than for 2023. Who said that? Yes. <laughs> As part of a request from the IRS to have race and ethnicity variables attached to some of its data, the Census Bureau is currently developing the local differentially private framework and tools to protect respondent confidentiality before sharing microdata. Who said that? It could, it could be both. It could be both. Sally. It could be Sally or Orlando Rodriguez. The Geography Division slash Census Bureau recommends employ data science principles and contemporary data sources to maintain the Math Tiger system using only in-office methods. Yes. Yes, Andrea and, and Deirdre. Consider adding data quality to the statistical product first guiding principles. Yes. Of the four frames, the demographic frame is the one that is new. Michael Radcliffe. And, and finally, this is a little tough. <laughs> For about 25 years, there's a lot in these things, at least in my mind. For about 25 years, I have been paying the water bill for a Lance Walker <laughs> who is believed to be staying at my address. Who said that? Lance Walker. Thank you very much. The proceedings are displayed at the census live link through YouTube found on the committee's website. <clears throat> closed captioning services is available by clicking the closed captioning icon that appears at the bottom of the YouTube video. First on today's agenda, our committee chair, Jay Bright, will provide opening remarks. <clears throat> Continuing with the overview, following Jay, Jason Fields and Neil Bennett will present on SIP Seamless, Modernizing the Survey of Income and Program Participation, followed by discussing John Chiker and committee discussion. Next, Joshua Coates, Shonen Aniker, Tim Fitzwater, and Hannah Rosenblum will present a two-part presentation on the statistical grids by the U.S. Census Bureau and Demo Base, International Gridded Population Mappings, followed by discussing Deborah Balk and committed discussion. After the presentation, we will then have public comment promptly at 1035. The Federal Register Notice located on the committee website provides more information on submitting written comments. There will be a break following the public comment period and thereafter, 
the committee discussion and formulation of recommendations. The committee will congregate amongst themselves to discuss and formulate recommendations, continue forming, uh, formulating recommendations during a working lunch. At 1.55 p.m., we will reconvene for Jay Bright's presentation of the 2024 uh, committee spring meeting recommendations until we adjourn at 2.30 p.m. Now, Jay. Thank you, Tommy. This is Jay Bright, chair of CSAC. And like Tommy, I have a few words of thanks organized slightly differently. So the first is specific, specific to this meeting. Thanks to everyone for a great meeting yesterday. I think we had really informative presentations and lively discussion. I think it was a great meeting. Thanks to the Bureau for bringing such interesting problems to our attention. Thanks, as always, to the advisory committee staff for all the work behind the scenes making the meeting run. And thanks to my colleagues for um, getting a lot of the recommendations I feel really good about where we are at this point, which may be jinxing us for latest this afternoon, but we'll see. And then more generally, as noted yesterday, I'm now finishing up six years on CSAC, three years as chair, and I want to thank the Bureau for the honor of selecting me to serve. It has really been one of my professional highlights over the years. I've really enjoyed my time on CSAC. I'd like to thank the advisory committee staff, um, present and past. You've always been wonderful to work with. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I'd like to thank Tommy in particular, um, co-chair for these meetings. Tommy is great, as you all know. And I'd like to thank the CSAC members, again, present and past. It has been a real privilege to work with you, work with such a distinguished and varied group of experts. And for those of you who don't get to see our deliberations, it's kind of magic the way things come together. And it's, it's really been a lot of fun. Again, goes on the professional highlight reel. So um, let's just briefly introduce ourselves uh, with our name and affiliation before we launch into the agenda. And I'll start, um, I'm Jay Bright, I'm a senior fellow at Nork at the University of Chicago. And then I'd like to call on Chris, who's on remotely, and then we'll go around the room. So Chris, can you introduce yourself? Yes, you can hear me. Uh, this is Chris Moore, um, senior scholar at Child Trends. I'm a social psychologist, and I work on youth and children issues and survey design. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. And then can we go with Chad and just around the room? I'm Chad Severson. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. I'm Claire Bowen. I'm a senior fellow at the Urban Institute and specialize in data privacy methodologies. I'm John Chaika. I'm a retired senior fellow for Mathematica. I'm Deborah Balk. I'm at the uh, CUNY Institute for Demographic Research in Baruch College at the City University of New York. Uh, I'm Lance Waller, a professor in the Department of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics in the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Uh, my areas of interest are small area estimation, statistical geography, and health disparities. Good morning. I'm Barbara Entwistle. I'm Keenan Professor of Sociology and Fellow of the Carolina Population Center at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Good morning. I'm Kunal Talwar. I'm a research scientist at Apple, and my interests are in differential privacy and machine learning. Good morning. I'm Ron Prevo, Senior Vice President at uh, Demographic Analytic Advisors. Gwen Evans Lomayespa, PhD student in demography at the University of Pennsylvania. Rogelio Sainz, I'm a professor of uh, sociology and demography at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Uh, I'm Seth Spielman. I'm a director in the core search and artificial intelligence group at Microsoft. Mario Marazzi, uh, director of statistics and data science for the Puerto Rico Judicial Branch. Thanks very much, everyone. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Tommy. Thank you very much, Jay. And now we'll hear from Jason Fields and Neil Bennett, who will present on SIP Seamless, Modernizing the Survey of Income and Program Participation. There's a discussion, John Chiker, and committee discussion. Good. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Really happy to be here. Um, and talking about SIP is always fun. So for those of you who haven't been talking about SIP for all of your lives, you know, this will be a good start. 
Um, all right, so what is SIP? Um, SIPs, SIP is a, is a longitudinal household panel survey uh, at the Census Bureau. It is unique in its um, mission and it's unique in its designs. Um, I use that plural intentionally. Um, SIP's purpose is and has been to provide high quality data on income, labor force participation, um, social program participation, eligibility, take up, um, and the effectiveness of, um, of these programs and the interrelationships with the household economy and the household demographics. Um, it is our survey's mission to provide annual and sub-annual dynamics um, to look at the movements in and out of government programs. The um, family and social context is one of the critical pieces that's added to SIP, so it's a very large, wide survey with a lot of richness, um, and we are intending to, to keep it in that mission. Um, and importantly, to be able to facilitate the interactions and the study of interactions in these areas. Um, back in 20, 2006 to 2013 or so, we re-engineered SIP into a design that trans, transitioned us into a once a year data collection. Um, there were lots of reasons for that. Uh, this is the outgrowth of that was an event history calendar-based instrument that collected data for an entire calendar year reference period and collected those data over the first six months of what we call the interview year. Um, we s provided the uh, event history calendar to facilitate recall to improve respondent and interviewer interactions. Um, and importantly, one of the things that we were able to do in this redesign is also shift to providing the public with a calendar year uh, rectangular data file, which, if familiar with old, old SIP, um, was a lot easier to use. We got a lot of positive feedback for that. However, we're doing all of this in the context of some, you know, crazy and dramatic drops in response rate, difficulties in the household survey environment. I certainly don't need to tell this group about that. Um, I'm just sharing here that SIP's not alone in this. Um, these are BLS's published data out on the, on the web, and you know all the surveys, including the CPS Monthly, is experiencing significant declines in response. But notably on here, um, hard surveys like CE and time use are experiencing very significant drops. SIP is in that ballpark. So over the course of the SIP panels, um, there is a natural decline in response from wave one to the end of the panel. We generally are interviewing about for a four year period. The original design was to do that every four months. That's what our waves are. Um, and the dots that are sitting here on waves one, four, um, seven and 10 are essentially the reflection of the new design, once a year interviewing and placed in about the right time point for them. But what you can see here is the interviewing environment and the response environment um, have dramatically impacted SIP's response rates. That's not the only thing that was going on with these, uh, these years. Um, we faced multiple furloughs, continuing uh, resolutions that pushed interviewer hiring, interviewer training out. This is one of the challenges of the SIP design, sort of an unintended consequence of being out there interviewing every, um, uh, every, every early spring. So, you know, we haven't been having full budgets by January, February when we start interviewing. That makes this process hard. Um, our item non-response rates in SIP are what they are. Uh, labor force is hard. Um, it is has the highest item non-response rate of our major sections. Um, but health insurance, fertility history, adult and child well-being, even demographics, it, you know, has some missing data in it. So what we're um, we are paying attention very much to data quality as we think about how SIP is designed and how we um, we go forward into the future. One of the things that we did kind of to, to um, respond to those challenging economic 
uh, situations, the furloughs, the continuing resolutions, the changing budget cycle, is a shift back to a design where we had overlapping panels. So between 1996 and 2008, SIP panels went end to end. So basically, large initial sample, followed those same people for four years, and then a new sample. That was okay when response rates didn't dip that much, but in the environment where we are now, in order to provide, house, to provide a stable uh, cross-sectional picture, an analytically useful calendar year of data, we began adding sample every year, essentially starting new mini panels. Coincidentally, this was the design that SIP originally had when it first started data collection in 1983. So, shifting over to Neil. Yep. Thanks, Jason. All right, so <clears throat> thank you, Jason, for providing um, the background of SIP, talking about our mission, the, the hurdles that we face with the current survey. Um, and, you know, many of the hurdles that we are facing, like Jason had mentioned, are, you know, not unique to SIP. Um, I think the, the Bureau as a whole recognizes the challenges to traditional data collection methods. Um, and there's this big movement within the Census Bureau um, towards innovating and finding ways that we can deliver statistical products that address the complex and diverse needs of our data users. Um, so this whole movement really provides a very unique opportunity for us to modernize the survey of income and program participation and to think about ways that we can bring this survey into the 21st century. And the things that we're thinking about with modernizing the SIP are <clears throat> developing multi-mode data collection, right? Moving towards internet self-response and in-person. Uh, we want to also redesign the survey to not just be more respondent and statistical product focused, but we're also thinking about ways that we can improve the hiring, training, and staffing cycle for SIP in-person interviewing. We also really want to think about our data processing and, and find ways to integrate into the business ecosystem so that we can streamline that processing and further incorporate administrative records into our survey. So, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk about the goals that we've outlined for the design, um, the design itself, and the timeline for implementation. And then I'll talk about the different elements of the redesign, what our goals are for each of those elements, and what we're doing in order to make those goals a reality. So when we were thinking about the new SIP design, there were components of the 2014 design that we wanted to carry forward. Um, as priorities, things that we felt we liked, things we knew were working. So some of these are, um, so one of these is keeping the rectangular public use file on an annual cycle. So when I say rectangular, I mean um, having a, a person month file where we have records for every month and each person out of the reference year. We also wanted to keep the overlapping panel structure that Jason had outlined. This allows us to maintain year-to-year -year comparisons, and it also stabilizes the resources for data collection over the course of a panel. We, uh, we want to, though, also set field record representatives um, on a schedule that is occurring every, so that interviews are occurring every month out of the year and not on a six-month cycle. And then finally, one thing that we're really thinking about is how to develop a more respondent-focused survey experience. So, one thing that we're doing is we're moving away from the event history calendar as a primary tool for data collection. We're also thinking about ways that we can simplify and reduce the repetition and content within the survey. And we also want to reduce the recall burden and shorten that. So here's the new SIP design. Um, for those of you that have worked with SIP for a long time and maybe have worked with the pre-2014 SIP, this design will look very familiar with, to you. Um, and that's because, in a sense, we're retrofitting the old SIP design, right? So we're bringing rotation groups back, we're shortening the recall periods, um, and let me break this down a little bit more. So highlighted in red, at the top of this diagram is reference year T. So this is, you can think of this as the year that we're interested in. This is what the year that we'll create the public use file for. And we break the sample up into six rotation groups. So 
the, the red box has moved, right? So this is a respondent who is in a wave one interview in rotation group one, will answer questions in January and February. And the reference period that they'll answer questions for are from July to December. These odd numbered waves um, for all six rotation groups will measure updates to the roster, monthly content, and annual content. Currently, we have annual content. We're considering setting it as of December of the prior year. This is how we structured it in the 2014 SIP. Um, we feel that this is you know, a, a nice reference period because it's, it's the end of a year. People have a good sense of you know, where their assets are at the end of the year. They have a sense of how much income they've received over the course of the year. Um, but we are open to reconsidering that to January of the reference year. So after we've cycled through all six of the rotation groups, we then move to the second wave of interviews. This is meant to be a shorter interview, more of a follow-up, where we would just measure updates to the roster and monthly content, right? Respondents would receive questions like, last time you told us you worked for ABC Employer, is that still the case? Um, so then after collecting three waves of information, right, we're, we're able to stitch together these three waves to get us that full reference year, um, the public use file the, that we would process and release. So when thinking about our sample design and our interview strategy, we're moving towards a web push design where we're still drawing the sample from household addresses and the preliminary contact would be sending mailers with an ISR option. Um, and respondents have one month to complete an ISR interview. In the second month, we would subsample from households that did not respond and conduct in-person interviews. This subsampling would use adaptive design in order to prioritize cases. And the other thing that we're really thinking about is ways to include incentives to, to get folks to complete interviews, especially internet self-response interviews. So to kind of put things into perspective, I'm, I'm gonna overlay the old and the new designs with each other. So highlighted in red, we have the current SIP design collection period and the reference year. You can see that, that the current SIP design collection occurs from January to June after the reference year. And that gives us information for that reference year T. So this is a very long retrospective period for respondents. In the new design, we're collecting information over the course of the reference year and stitching that information together. This, I wanna highlight this, this poses a challenge for us, right? And I'll talk about this a little bit more um, on the next slide, but we want to produce an overlapping year of data so that our data users have the ability to directly compare um, the old and the new designs. But it's, it's really challenging for us um, administratively and from a resource perspective um, to, to, to have the two designs um, collected at the same time. So the timeline for implementation are from now until July 2025, we're thinking about ways that we can streamline this instrument, right? We're thinking about what content we want within the instrument, how we can restructure it to make a more, um, a more streamlined instrument. And then from July 2025 to July 2027, um, we'll develop the instrument. So moving into the, the new software, um, Centurion 2.0, um, the new instrument software and developing production from July 2027 to January 2028, we'll conduct an ISR field test to see how the instrument operates um, in an ISR setting. And then, as I had talked about before, right, from January 2028 to June 2029, we are looking to do conduct a, an, a, a dual data collection. So this is two series of collecting information in the old and the new design in order to get that overlapping year. Finally, in January of 2030, we'll be fully transitioned into the new instrument. So there's a lot of elements and a lot of moving parts that go into this redesign. 
Um, and as a roadmap for the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about these redesign elements. And I want to talk about the priorities that we've outlined for each of these items and what it is that we're doing in order to make our goals happen. So I'll talk about changes to content, the use of administrative records, and our changes to survey production. So when thinking about the changes that we're making to our content, our priorities, one of our top priorities, is to continue to pursue SIP's mission. Jason already outlined what SIP's mission is, so I won't repeat it here again. Um, but that is a, a huge priority when thinking about what content we're focusing on. We also want to keep the monthly dynamics of SIP. This is a really unique component of SIP, and we really want to focus on developing statistical products that SIP brings to the table. We're also very focused on shortening interviews, so finding ways to not just pare down content, but also consolidate items um, and use uh, administrative records whenever relevant or possible. So in order to achieve these goals, subject matter experts are engaged in uh, making improvements to their content. Branches are meeting, I, I say across Seaside, but this is actually across the demographic directorate. Um, so folks are meeting to coordinate improvements on topics. We're holding on-site meetings throughout the course of March to really take a detailed look into what changes we want to make to SIP. The other thing is that we're working with survey methodologists to test our content. We have um, a cognitive test occurring right now um, and a number of other cognitive tests in the works. We are placing questions on high-frequency surveys like the household panel to test and develop how our content works uh, to see how it fares in an ISR setting. We're also holding focus groups uh, to receive feedback from field representatives on topic areas. To give you an example of what these changes to content look like, um, I've set out this kind of stylized example. I should note here that these aren't all the topics within SIP, um, and for each of these there are topics uh, between blocks, right? So. When a respondent answers questions in the SIP currently, within the event history calendar, they answer questions about SSI, food stamps or SNAP, and WIC. They'll also answer, they'll then answer questions about a number of other topics and move on to post-EHC programs like disability income and food assistance. And then further down in the instrument, they answer questions about disability and food security. One thing that we've heard from respondents and FRs is they feel like we're re-asking questions, right? They, they ask, why are you asking me this again? So one thing that we're thinking about is reordering select sections and topics so that items that are similar are placed together, right? And a respondent just feels like we touch program receipt around food security once. So our reordering that we're considering are asking questions about food security and then following up with questions related to SNAP, WIC, and food assistance. And then similarly, later in the instrument, we ask questions about disability and follow up with disability income and SSI. Um, we are considering the ordering of within these topic areas. So do we ask the programs first and then do we follow up with the food security questions? Or do we ask food security first and then follow up with the programs? So when thinking about using administrative records, our priorities are to really leverage the enterprise data ingest in order to, to find ways to use administrative records. And we want to improve data quality, reduce respondent burden, and really embrace a statistical products first focus. Um, so in order to make these priorities happen, um, we want to expand the use of statistical model-based imputation. SIP already conducts model-based imputation for 40 topics over 100 items, but we want to expand that even further. We also want to use administrative records in the development of survey weights. Um, there are some research papers that are being worked on currently in the, sense, in the Bureau to see how estimates change when we incorporate administrative records into survey weights. We also want to supplement frames data with administrative data, and we want to use adaptive design to improve the efficiency and representativeness for optimized collection. When thinking about reducing respondent burden, 
One thing that we're really exploring is using the business register to develop an employer address lookup tool. This means a respondent could say, I work for X restaurant on Main Street. A number of restaurants would pop up and they could select their employer. This would allow us to make a connection between the employer and the establishment that the respondent works at. If that connection is made, we could then take questions related to the establishment off path and reduce respondent burden. This means that we're exploring the use of modeling to remove these items. Finally, we're developing alternative estimates and we're continuing to think about SIP synthetic data. So we're thinking about ways that we can develop small area estimation for wealth and other topics, and then also reviving SIP synthetic beta in the gold standard development. So when thinking about changes to survey product production, our priorities are we're moving from SAS to Python. We also want to use administrative records in editing and processing. And finally, we want to leverage the enterprise data lake to see how we can expand computing options. So when thinking about changes to survey production, um, we've already started converting SIP edits from SAS to Python. Our programmers are also thinking about ways that we can use hot deck imputation in Python. Um, but on top of that, we're also conducting research to see how model-based imputation could be used as a replacement to hot deck imputation. This is a, a way that we want to modernize the survey even further. Um, we're also thinking about how to improve our variable editing, right? What, is, what are the standard operating procedures that we can build in for edits that better fit within a Python framework? We also want to build in parallel computing um, to optimize data processing. So with all of this in mind, we have a number of questions for you. One thing at the forefront of our mind is we want to offer data users parallel data files for an overlapping year. We feel that this is a break-in series that is large enough that our data users need to have a direct comparison. But we recognize that there are financial and administrative constraints to collecting and publishing uh, data files that overlap in a year. So to what extent would you suggest we prioritize an overlapping data year in light of these constraints? And if we're not able to do that, what would you suggest as a suitable alternative? Our second question is, we currently make use of administrative data in a number of phases of the survey lifecycle. Um, as I had indicated in the, con in, in the presentation, we're looking to use the business register to facilitate the specific employer and, ad and establishment identification as SIP respondents report their jobs. Um, to facilitate this, we need to ensure that data protections are sufficient to enable the use of high quality administrative sources. Uh, so this means that data users will have access to modeled estimates for these variables. What are your thoughts? Do you support this? We also want to know, are there other substantive areas where CSAC would recommend that we pursue this type of integration? Finally, SIP is unique to the demographic surveys because of the rich demographic information and the mon monthly dynamics that we measure. What are the distinct value adds of this survey that you would recommend we focus on when thinking about our content? And currently, we publish an annual report and table package on the wealth and debt of households. What additional data products and key estimates would you recommend that we publish from SIP on a regular basis? So, thank you. Thank you, Jason and Neil. This is Jay Bright, and I'd like to recognize John Chaika as our CSAC discussant. John Chaika. Um, I want to commend the Bureau for undertaking this effort to address some of the serious problems that have developed with SIP over the last few years. And especially thank Jason and Neil for a really good presentation. Uh, I think there was more here than I saw in the slides, so there'll be some overlap in what I, what I cover. Um, and um, I recognize the other members of the committee that worked with me on this. They're listed here. Next slide. Uh, I want to start with a brief history of SIP. Jason ended up covering uh, quite a bit of this, but, but for the benefit of uh, committee members who... who didn't grow up with SIP the way I did. Uh, and uh, SIP was introduced, as Jason said, in the fall of 1983. This followed a very substantial income survey development program 
which included, I think, two panels that were put out in the field, extensive study to come up with that original design. Um, one of the major objectives at the time was to enable the estimation of program eligibility on a monthly basis, the way many programs operated. The, the limitations of using annual data for this had become very evident. And so this was an important component of SIP in addition to the monthly dynamics of income and program participation and capturing multiple program participation. Uh, the initial design, as I said, had four rotation groups that uh, were fielded uh, in consecutive months. And each of these rotation groups collected data on the four previous months. The panel lengths initially ran about two and a half years. And uh, new panels were introduced annually, at least initially. Um, there were also topical modules that were not part of the, the regular series of interviews. And these were... Um, conducted on specific topics, and they had a different reference period. Uh, one example was wealth, where you really needed to collect this only once a year. Child care arrangements, I think, was another one in that group. Fertility histories, uh, the things that were out of the, the monthly uh, 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 framework. Um, in 1996, redesign, uh, as Jason said, uh, eliminated the overlapping panels and, and instead introduced these abutted panels, where a panel would would, would start only after the previous one finished, and the length of the panels was increased to four years at that time. And then a re-engineering of, of SIP followed its temporary termination. Um, this replaced the four-month reference period with an annual reference period, which raised all sorts of issues for, for um, users of the data, concerns about the quality. Uh, a, a major attempt to address concerns about trying to collect monthly data for such a long reference period was this event history calendar that attempted to let people tie changes in their programs and so on to major life events. But I have to say it wasn't really fully implemented. It wasn't used a lot. It, it just wasn't that successful. And uh, so it's not surprising it's going away. Uh, next slide. So there are a number of issues that, uh, with respect to measurement that have uh, did this go off or just the light? It's still working? Yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, despite the short reference period, a, a very pronounced seam bias was evident in SIP right from the beginning, uh, where transitions occurred disproportionately at the seams between waves rather than within waves. Um, and spell lengths before the 2014 changes were predominantly multiples of four, which was extremely frustrating for, for users trying to look at spell length. Um, the underreporting of program participation persists. Uh, SIP is not nearly as bad as many other surveys, but it's still a serious problem. Um, the quality of the income data has been observed to decline uh, pretty substantially from the beginning of SIP. It, it's not clear why. Um, but part of the early success may have been this is a great new survey. Everyone was really excited. The field workers were excited. And that may have ch changed over time. Um, something else that uh, was observed when SIP moved to the four-year panels was that poverty in particular exhibited a within-panel trend uh, that was different from cross-sectional estimates. Uh, poverty would tend to decline over the life of a panel, uh, whether or not poverty was declining in the population. And this was a, a serious issue with, with the longer panel. It was one of the reasons why SIP wasn't chosen to become the new source of the supplemental poverty measure, which had been the, the initial uh, recommendation. Uh, you, you really don't want your poverty estimate. <laughs> you know, if you line it up with presidential administrations, poverty is improving over the course of the administration, which might be helpful. And then it goes back up with, with the next one. Um, <clears throat> the attrition has grown over time. Uh, which jeopardizes not only the representative of the longitudinal estimates, but uh, um, well, one response to that was reintroducing the overlapping panels because then you get a, a consistent bias over time and, and not a bias that changes over the, the years. Uh, the wave one response rates, as Jason, Jason showed, have really declined, and that jeopardizes data collection. Uh, next slide. So... Uh, 
as I said, the, the, the new design is resurrecting a lot of elements of the original SIP design, uh, but with six rotation groups instead of four, a six-month reference period instead of a four-month reference period, uh, data collection is distributed evenly across the year. This is a, a huge help because SIPs had a terrible problem with the annual design and the way budgets have worked, and it, it's rare, I think, that you've been able to start the interviewing when you wanted to uh, each year. Um, the overlapping panels, uh, again, is something that serves a critical function. And selected items, uh, and your description was a little different here, but presumably of the types that were once collected in topical modules uh, would be collected in odd-numbered waves and uh, uh, separately from the uh, monthly collection. Next slide. So there are some uh, significant innovations that are part of the redesign. And one is the introduction of a two-phase data collection for each rotation group. Uh, this has the effect of reducing field work because of the internet self-response component, uh, and uh, it should increase the weighted response rate. This is, uh, in effect, the ACS design, which has been very successful, and it's a design that uh, a lot of survey organizations are moving to in an effort to address declining response rates. The idea is you, you, you get big bangs for your buck with an internet response, and then you devote extra resources to trying to capture uh, the non-respondents to the first wave. Um, the uh, use of administrative records in uh, imputation to replace some of the content. Uh, one can hope that this improves the estimates of program participation while also reducing the respondent burden. And with the increased use of model imputation in place of hot tech imputation, that should also improve the, the quality of the data. Uh, something that model-based imputation allows is unlimited in effect, numbers of variables as predictors. And uh, a, a real limitation of the hot deck approach has been that, one, you've got to use categorical variables, and you can't have very many. And this has been, you know, has led to problems. Uh, Pat Doyle, many years ago, uh, identified an issue where uh, high-income food stamp recipients were being created by the imputations because they didn't take into account eligibility or even reported program participation. Uh, next slide. So a few implications of the proposed design. <laughs> As with the original uh, design, the staggered reference periods by rotation group mean that only one calendar month will be included in all of the rotation groups for a, a given series. And for the odd-numbered waves here, that will be December. And for the even-numbered waves, it'll be June. Uh, it will take data from three waves to construct an estimate for any 12-month period uh, if you're using all the rotation groups. Uh, the seam bias will be eliminated from cross-sectional estimates, uh, which was at, with the original design. And, um, but the bias in spell lengths presumably will, will now show up at multiples of six months instead of four. Uh, but this is, in my view, vastly better than, than these, the massive January seams that, that uh, are observed with the current design. And depending on the reference period, um, the annual estimates that are collected in these odd-numbered waves will continue to present different recall demands. For example, if you want to capture wealth for December, it's going to be one month ago for one-sixth of the sample, two months, and so on. Uh, next slide. So one recommendation that well may become a recommendation is why not start the survey in February instead of January? Uh, this would make January rather than December the common month from, for the first uh, for, for the uh, odd numbered waves, and um, this would be actually consistent with the original SIP design. If you don't do this, what happens is your your first rotation group doesn't collect any data that it's going to be useful for that calendar year. Uh, of, of the, uh, the first year. And that seems to be undesirable. Uh, next slide. Uh, with respect to uh, non-response adjustments, uh, even if the two-phase approach and other modifications markedly improve the unit response rates, differential non-response is going to continue to be a problem. Uh, the Bureau presentation uh, does not mention prospective enhancements to unit non-response adjustments. Um, the, the frames data 
you know, this may be a potential source of covariates for, for the initial sample. Uh, and I also wonder if administrative data can also provide some additional covariates if it's matched to the households in the sample. And I also wonder um, if the Bureau does plan to include administrative records in its model-based imputation, because that's something that could really help. I think you were alluding to that in, this, in the talk today. Uh, next slide. With regard to the reordering of topics, uh, you seem to be totally on top of this. Uh, uh, you know, question sequence can matter for things. And if you ask people, uh, are they experiencing food security, but then turn around you know, and put them in a situation saying, are you participating in programs that are going to help you with this, it, it may bias the responses one way or the other. Uh, next slide. So with respect to your, your questions, uh, something that may not have been clear from the presentation is that the, the way the two designs will, will line up, uh, if you start the new design in 2028, you will still continue 2028 under the old design in order to get 2027 data, which you would not otherwise have. So to get an overlapping data of, for comparison, you'd have to continue the old design into the second year. So you really have two years of, of the overlap. And this is where the resource issues become a serious concern, and we recognize that. Um, at the same time, uh, we think it's critical that the Bureau be able to compare the two designs for the first months of, of the uh, calendar year, because that's where the current design has its greatest issues because of the long recall. And uh, so for that reason, you do want to be able to do something to compare calendar years. Our suggestion uh, is to look for, for program participation in particular and administrative data that you can compare, basically a, an external source of validation, and compare the old estimates by month with that source for 2027, uh, and then the new survey for 2028 you know, for, for the program data for the next year. And so you're comparing the two to, to something that's more accurate, and, and this it's something you probably want to do anyway, it's not just a matter of comparing the two to each other. Um, for other characteristics, uh, the issue is can you assume that things will not have changed between the two years and then make comparisons between the two years. Uh, you do run risks with that. Uh, you know, we've run through the pandemic, we've had recessions. Uh, 2028 is also a presidential election year. Does that have any impact on, on data? Who, who knows? But, but there are these potential concerns. Uh, next slide. With regard to a synthetic data, uh, the Bureau is proposing to use the business register data uh, as a source of uh, information on employers. And, and we think you mean both, both firm and establishment. Uh, whatever SIP does you know, should be the same. Um, we appreciate this goal of trying to reduce the survey uh, burden on respondents. And, um, but synthesis is tricky. Uh, you just have to witness the experience with the ACS where the goal was to produce a synthetic file and that, I guess that's been abandoned or at least substantially pushed back. Uh, and so that, that is, is a concern. Also in other contexts, uh, synthesis is increasingly becoming paired with some sort of validation or verification process where uh, people who can produce estimates using synthetic data uh, can then have these same programs run on the real data and some kind of feedback is given to them. Uh, that's been done with fully synthetic data. I, I don't know if it's worth doing it if you're uh, synthesizing only some of the variables, but that is, is something to think about and, and a kind of concern that users may, may want to raise. Um, I guess CSAC, I'm saying we'd, we'd like to see some good evidence that, that this synthesis approach works well before we say, yeah, it's a great idea. Uh, uh, next slide. With regard to other areas where uh, this kind of approach might be useful, program participation is the obvious one. This is an area where underreporting has persisted and uh, making use of actual program participation could be really helpful here. Uh, the question regarding synthesis is, can it replicate the complex relationships between program participation and the various variables that contribute to eligibility? Uh, can it properly capture multiple program participation? Uh, we do wonder if an alternative form of disclosure 
avoidance could be applied instead of synthesis, you know, maybe adding, adding noise, uh, which you obviously have great experience with. And um, whatever the choice, uh, the committee feels that a slow rollout of whatever you're doing and lots of communication with users to regain their trust uh, would really be helpful. Next slide. And lastly, with respect to SIP's value added, um, we identify three areas that, that we think are really, really important. One is health insurance coverage dynamics. Uh, many of the studies that look at this topic are limited by what's available in administrative data, and that may be largely Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, the, the, public, the private programs, uh, the data is pretty sketchy, and you're otherwise also not collecting information on, on having no health insurance. And this is something where, where SIP has really been useful. Uh, program participation rates, actually, not just the participation, but based on simulations of eligibility, something that, that SIP could do. I haven't seen reports on that. Uh, you know, Urban Institute and Mathematica do this for different programs, uh, but it would be great to see something from the Bureau. And, of course, household and family composition dynamics, where, where SIP is really, really unique. Uh, with regard to products, um, you currently produce an annual wealth report, and I would personally like to see that expanded. Um, the Bureau puts out a, a great number of supplemental tables, but they're not incorporated into the analysis. And one thing that would be really helpful is to see how the, the distribution of, of assets, as well as their amounts, varies for different subsets of the population uh, by age, by uh, income level, by poverty level. Uh, and that's in those tables. <laughs> But uh, the Bureau's not extracting it. And I think, I think your, your searches will be happy to be able to do that extra work. Uh, in addition to that, I think you could revisit some of the topics that have been published uh, on a more sporadic basis for SIP. And this has included uh, reports on in, uh, income sources of older households. Um, SIP's actually very important here. Uh, there's a statistic, what percentage of the population elderly population relies entirely on Social Security. And the answer for SIP is markedly lower than it is for CPS, but the CPS number is politically popular. And uh, that's no reason not to, to push the SIP numbers, but it would be nice to, to have some more regular reporting on that. Uh, benefits received by veterans, uh, the number, timing, and duration of marriages, and parental presence among children. And then additional reports would be useful on child care arrangements. This is something where SIP has collected really extensive data, uh, and not much of it sees the light, uh, certainly not from the Bureau side. Uh, adult and child well-being, and uh, lastly, the income dynamics within a year of low-income families, because this is something we don't see much of, but it's really important to understand uh, how complex uh, income is for low-income families. And that's it. I thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, this is Jay Bright, and I'd like to invite Jason and Neil if they have any quick responses before we open it up for a broader CSAC discussion. Sure. Uh, just a, a couple clarification points, um, and thank you very much for the comments. Well, well thought through and well received on, on our part. Um, I just want to do uh, wanted to be clear uh, just a couple things in our in our concept in our conception of the timing and we recognize the January cross-sectional reference versus a December cross-sectional reference has different values um, to the point about the first rotation group not providing any data one of the things we're talking about is including data from the December of the year prior along with each data file. So each data file would have December of the reference year, December of the prior year. Move on a year. December of the prior year, December of the reference year. So just it would provide that moving bounding data component. Regardless, shifting it, everything over a month is not a big deal. Um, it's kind of a preference. It's like where, where do we want that slice to be? Um, and I think that that's a... a fine topic for, for discussion, and there's good justification on, on both sides. Um, in terms of the, the modeling, I, what I want to be clear first is our current uh, missing data modeling that is done 
Um, one of the important characteristics of it is that it does include administrative data on the right-hand side. So data from the Social Security Administration and the IRS are included as predictors. Um, and one of the other benefits of the way modeling works in separately from uh, hot decks is that you can incorporate relationships among other variables from other household members and within household you know, compositional issues. Um, and that is also right-hand side information. So the, the power of the models extends both to incorporating administrative data and incorporating more nuanced relationships in terms of how, uh, how variables within the data structure are, uh, are, are uh, co uh, co vary, et cetera, yeah. Um, so one of the things that um, I want to absolutely, third external data, third point of data for common validation for both um, old and new designs, Absolutely, we did that for the 2014 uh, data. Um, we absolutely expect to be doing that. Um, the question is how close can we get the two data sources and what are the um, administrative and financial constraints for collecting data in multiple methods at the same time. Um, it, the money comes has to come from somewhere. Um, and I wanna also put in a note just about the comments about data synthesis and how we would use the data from the BR, um, that is all needs to get worked out. Um, this would be a first for integrating an administrative third party data source into the collection itself, drawing data out of it. Right now we use administrative data in our editing and imputation. I already talked about the imputation, but on the editing side, for example, we're, uh, correcting program confusion between SSI and OASDI using administrative reports during processing. Okay, we have to walk a very fine line in terms of how those data make it into the public use and what are the distributional characteristics. We can't just put administrative data out on a public use file. So that becomes, so whether it's synthetic, whether it's noise infused, some component of reported and administrative uh, distribution, we, the, absolutely, your comments are, are right on and we have to, that's an area where we really have to think about how these firm characteristics, establishment characteristics are distributionally in combination from the BR reports, the BR data and the uh, survey respondent reports. Um, and I think the, uh, yeah, I think the last comment I wanted to make um, related to this is, you know, I think you're right on with the um, other suggested reports. We're, we're looking for where is SIP's key indicator value? What, where can it make us a mark in the portfolio of government statistics that builds both confidence in the data and reliance on the data? So... Neil, do you have nope. comments you want to add? Thank you so much. This is Jay Bright again. Um, we're now opening the floor for general CSAC discussion. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Lance. So thanks, thanks for the presentation and a lot of um, fascinating work. Uh, just a couple of comments. I really like the detail that you put into the use of administrative data. Sometimes it's said we're going to use administrative data it'll get better and you make this really good point that you really have to understand what that what those data are as they go in because administrative data builds to a quality that meets its original purpose and if it's not consistent with where you want to take it next then you know I think that sort of documentation is really essential and really um, you know my hat's off to you for that and I, I remember someone and then the model based I remember somebody telling me, I think I said this in the November, you know, design what you can and then model the rest. And this is a very, putting that right into action very well. It doesn't diminish the importance of the design for all of the, the reasons discussed, but also says the design can take you so far and you're under a lot of constraints for that design. Designing to meet the constraints at some point cuts back what you can do. So this, uh, it just 
just a comment that it's it's really great to see the the detail of how to make good use of particular administrative data to take this further. Um, and that was that's what I wanted to say. So thanks. Thanks, Lance. Um, Claire, and then Rogelio. Claire Bowen, CSAC. Uh, I wanted to see if you guys had any comments about the synthetic beta SIP. So if there's a relationship with your ongoing work with that, considering it was discontinued, especially with uh, John Shaika's comments about like a verification validation server, because there was one, but then got discontinued back in 2022, uh, I think, with trying to find like a lack of home and things. And so that's my first question. The second one is that I heard that you or heard from your presentation about using Python code, which is really exciting because you're using more open source, but is there any plans to public release parts of that code? Because I imagine you might not have to really, can't release all of it because of the sensitivity of the data, but if there was like pieces of it that could become more publicly available for others to, to use. Yeah, so um, thank you. Two, two quick uh, pieces about that. So to be clear, SIP synthetic beta is not discontinued. It is, as you said, looking for a server home. So we are taking it back internally to the Census Bureau. Um, the way SIP synthetic beta was accessed through the Cornell Virtual Data Server um, data center uh, it was, was great, it, but it took a lot of resources on Cornell's side and it took resources in terms of doing validation. So what you know, most people might not know, there's not a validation server, there's validation people, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there are people doing the validation work of, of people's external people's code, running it on the gold standard data, looking at, uh, you know, for disclosure risks as well as, you know, uh, as well as some, um, they don't really do evaluations of your analysis, but they, they look to make sure what you have done is coherent from a processing point of view, et cetera. Um, so we are continuing it. We have everything that has been done. We're looking at what the next steps are to integrate additional panel years of SIP. Um, so for those of you who haven't taken a look at um, SIP synthetic in the past, we hope to be able to give it back to you with even more in it, but at least get what was previously available at Cornell up again. So that work is ongoing. Um, it's a little bit tied up in the business ecosystem transitions and how do we want to do this and how, do, who, how can we provide external access into this system? What are the components there? So from an IT point of view, which I am not an IT specialist, there's, um, there's a lot going on there. So, but rest assured, not dead, coming back. Um, right, uh, the second. Python. Python, yeah. Python. So I am 100% for releasing as much code as we can. Uh, you know, um, I don't know exactly what will be able to be released. Um, I think the constraints on our side are making sure that what code is of the processing doesn't reveal, you know, elements of data structure that could reveal sample design, for example, because we don't want to necessarily, we can't release the sample PSUs and the, that part of the structure. But I think the code, there's, in my head, there's no reason not to share code, right? Can I add? Yeah. Okay. So um, I'll just speak a little bit more on the publishing of Python code. So SIP, um, our survey coordination and outreach staff, um, they release Python code already. Um, this code is mostly just to get data users off the ground to get their feet wet with SIP, right, to figure out how to, how to best download the variables and work with them in a preliminary sense. Um, we also, I think sometimes if there are user notes that we publish that may require um, some additional work on the user's part, um, we release code related to those user notes. Um, and sometimes that's in SAS, but I think we're starting to kind of move more towards Python on that, so. Yeah, so I, yeah, and, and I, I apologize because I, I was thinking you were and probably are talking a little bit about 
our internal data processing steps and editing right. and imputation yes. code. Yeah. All, all of the above. So we, we are all definitely interested in moving more code out into the public sphere. Um, and to be clear, it's not just Python. We are also making a transition on the analytics side off of SAS and trying to embrace R. Um, so we're hoping to be able to also provide R code as we work with it more. Um, and I did want to make a comment just also related to Lance's comment real quick, and that is that we didn't really talk about it, but one of the points that John brought up was about data quality and administrative data attached to frames. We are doing evaluations of that in terms of kind of getting that external distribution um, as an additional raking variables, as additional ways to pull um, non-response back in, or pull the data back into a line, into alignment, counting for non-response. So um, we have folks that are looking at, for example, measures like the data defect correlation and other, other components of getting an additional distribution beyond what's in our pop controls. This is Claire Bowen, CSAC. Thank you so much for answering my questions. And I think at a later time, I'd love to follow up with you guys on, on the synthetic beta as well as thinking about like the validation server. Because I, I, knew, I knew it was a very manual process. This is something actually I've been researching myself on seeing how to automate it. So, Thank you. Uh, Rogelio and then Chris Moore. Rogelio Sainz, uh, CSAC. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Very informative on the issues as well as the, the strategy that you're considering. One of the things that occurred to me as you were talking about this, particularly with um, people not participating and, and the participation rate going down, is uh, looking at incentives. And Neil mentioned uh, the, uh, that there were some consideration of incentives. So if you could elaborate maybe on what you're thinking about. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So let me first start by saying that, you know, all of our use of incentives have to get approved by OMB. Um, but one of the things that we are looking at is in the shift to an ISR mode, there's a lot of good evidence from other survey organizations about using incentives as, as initial pushes to web, ways to get early bird responses, ways to ensure completion um, before you make the shift out to field work, right? So if I can, obviously, so we're, we are thinking about incentives and thinking about the level of incentives and the timing of incentives. Um, so we have a couple different contact and incentive strategies that we are working on. Um, and I think that one of the things that is going to be important for us in our, the way we think about it and communicate incentives is that it aligns with OMB's requirements that incentives not be coercive, that incentives be, you know, in response to, you know, the actual need. SIP has only ever had incentives up to about the $40 mark. Um, but in this ISR component, I think that we're probably going to have to look at some larger incentives um, to get folks to participate. Um, but we don't want to have that be also a source of bias. So we need to pay real close attention to who's responding with incentives, who's responding without incentives, et cetera, and who gets shifted off to field um, for non-response follow-up, and then how do we incentivize those cases as well. Thank you. Chris Moore, please go ahead. Thank you, Chris Moore. Um, Thank you for not only your presentation, but this thoughtful work. Yeah, it's a very important study. Um, I wanted to talk about the definition of the well-being of adults and children, um, because it oftentimes is defined as, you know, income and uh, wealth, poverty, which are very important, but they're not a complete um, view on, well, on uh, well-being. And looking across the various surveys and frames, SIP is a real um, opportunity to provide that. And I'd like to know um, what the plans are for measuring that um, beyond disability. Um, There's a lot of really good single item questions like um, mental and emotional health, uh, health status, family dinners, childcare. And it seems to me that these are important constructs that are related to income. Um, they have 
pretty good response. They actually probably are in a form of incentive to encourage people to participate. Um, but also some of these items might um, provide information about the presence of young children in the home, for example, the child care questions. So I just wanted to ask what the plans are more specifically about including them. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Chris. Um, no, you're absolutely, absolutely right. And we are, SIP has always had s components of uh, well-being that, ex that were beyond material well-being and beyond the economic definition of well-being. Um, and we think that that's important to be able to bring into the new design. Um, so one of the things that we're thinking about and looking at are the measures of subjective well-being that are reportable, applicable to the household, um, relevant in the context of when we're talking about ISR, we have to make sure that we're asking questions that that one respondent can reasonably report. So some of the international suggestions include using a standardized uh, life satisfaction measure, um, looking at happiness measures. Those are okay, but that talks about one person, right? So we are thinking about the importance of that, it, that, that comparative measure of subjective well-being, as well as the measures like you, you've mentioned, the eating dinner uh, with your family um, that we've had in the child well-being module. Um, so we're looking at that pool, and I agree with you 100% that some kind of outcome measures that are tied to some subjective measures of well-being um, are important, and we're just trying to find what is that best small set that could be reported by a single household respondent. So I will probably be reaching out to you for some additional conversations. Um, but yeah, and we welcome any other comments that CSAC or you have. Great. Happy to help. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you, very much. Uh, thank you. And I think we are right at time. So I'll hand it back to Tommy Wright. I'm your right. Thank you very much, Jason, Neil, and John, for the discussion, as well as committee members. I should note that uh, the next session uh, may run into our 1035 time period, and if so, please forgive me. I will need to interrupt for public comment. We will now hear from Joshua Coots, Shonan Anika. <coughs> Tim Fitzwater, and Hannah Rosenblum, who will present a two-part presentation on statistical grids for the U.S. Census Bureau and demo base, international gridded population, followed by discussing Deborah Balk, and of course, committee discussion. When we were discussing this, I think Hannah was going to go first. I don't know if she's available already. We can obviously go if she's not, but. Slides are in order, so you should just go ahead. Okay. Okay, no problem. So. Uh, is there a clicker? Clicker. So my name is. Uh, is there? Is there? A, yeah. Is that okay? Great. So I'm I'm Josh Coots. Uh, I'm a geographer in the geography uh, division. Uh, I'm the chief of the international national engagement branch, and uh, I am here with my colleague Sean and Anniker. We're both geographers, and so uh, we've been working on this statistical grids project, a new project, and so. Let's get right into it. So the statistical uh, grids, the basic idea, I know we're, we're, uh, there are two presentations, so I'm going to be brief with my uh, comments, but why are we doing this, I think, is, is what I get from a lot of people. Why are we starting to do this with statistical grids? Um, and it's really responding to user demands. We've heard over the years uh, many times from different user groups that this is something that people that people want. Yeah. Thanks. Um, 
and you know one of the one of the reasons that people ask for this is to for uh, increasingly accessible and interoperable data products. We can take data sources from multiple domains and create a new product with that. And statistical grids, uh, we're positioning that as a vehicle to do that, uh, to bridge between our statistics and other domains. Um, and also to meet internal mission demands. So we have identified several use cases internally for the use of a grid. You may have heard uh, some of our colleagues yesterday talk about how they are looking at uh, implementing grids internally for the in-office address canvassing efforts and, and for the, the new addressing uh, efforts. Uh, and then also to uh, support informed, timely decisions. If we have these grids, uh, the idea is that we can more quickly integrate with other data sets. So, and I do want to level set at the very beginning uh, and make it clear, because this is also another question, uh, grids are intended to be in addition to our current administrative statistical geographic units. They're not intended to replace anything. This will be a new and added uh, geographic layer. Um, and they also, the intent is for these to become a standard annual public delivery. Um, that will, this is not a one-shot deal. We're going to be producing these every year once we get them. So again, why grids? Uh, normalizing our data by area and creating a uniform unit across the nation has been identified as something that, again, our stakeholders want. We can see the utility of it. They're consistent and unchanging. Once we implement these grids, the intent is for them to stay, remain stable. Uh, year to year, decade to decade, we can watch across time. All of our current units, all of them, states, even our international boundaries, change over time. The grids are intended to remain stable. Uh, again, easily integrated with other, other gridded data sets, such as Earth observation data. Over the years, we've seen the rise of Earth observation data, the rise of similar types of data. Uh, this is a bridge between our current statistical units and that those huge uh, data sets that are out there. There's also an identification of zero and null values being useful, that if we can determine where there is no data, so for example, where there is no housing, some of our units right now, such as uh, census tracts, have a threshold. They, we have to have a certain amount of data within them to publish or to even create that unit in the first place. Grids don't have that constraint. We can identify where people, for example, FEMA, if there's a disaster, where they don't need to respond. Um, and again, stable work units for internal operations and external operations. And again, to reiterate, the intent at this point in time, our intent on this project is not to replace any of our current geographies. This will be an additional uh, layer of data. Uh, and then I'm going to switch over to my colleague, Sean Anaker. All right. Thank you, Josh. Um, so I'm just going to go into a little bit more detail about the advantages of grids and why we're... Um, why we're pursuing them with more pictures, uh, basically. So, um, so to start with, um, the point on the um, the for analysis over time for temporal analysis. So, if you're just a kind of naive Wikipedia user going in looking at um, our census data um, for uh, this is for Kyle, Texas, one of the fastest growing uh, incorporated places in the country. Uh, you'll see, you know, this is you know. On the left, you'll just see this immense growth in the population. Um, and it is growing very fast in population. But um, if you were to look at the boundaries of the incorporated place, you will also see there's a great expansion in the physical size of Kyle, Texas. And so when you add time to the equation, it's hard to disentangle what changes are due to the content um, and what changes are due to differences in the container, the geographic unit. So one of the main purposes of grid cells is to take all that off the table. So the, the grid cells are defined mathematically. They'll not change over time. Um, none of our other geographies really do that. There's some that, you know, kind of attempt to do it, like tracks we attempt to keep stable. Uh, but as you know, um, they're based on population thresholds. So in areas of growth, they're often split. Uh, small areas like tabulation blocks are even worse. Um, in areas where there's change, which is often the most interesting areas for temporal analysis, blocks are completely different from one year to the other because they're built, they're, they're blocks. They're, they're basically built on roads. 
So if there's new roads, you have a whole new set of, of things that have no relationship to what was there before. Um, so grid cells are designed to avoid that. Um, so here's an example of a, of a grid cell system that's currently in use. Uh, this is Oak Ridge National Lab's uh, land scan product. Uh, and you see the two um, vintages here for uh, Cape Coral and Fort Myers, Florida. So here you can see, um, you know, on the right there that on the grid cell, you can really see the, the areas where things have changed really stand out. Um, and if, if we were looking at tabulation blocks for this example, you, you would not see this clear uh, difference um, in, in, in where change has occurred. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the major advantages. Uh, getting to what Josh was talking about with integrating data. So um, this is an example from the Japanese Statistical Agency. And um, basically, we're kind of in a position similar to a lot of other statistical agencies around the world where we're just beginning at looking at this. And, you know, all of, a lot of the national agencies seem to be in the same position where they're trying to figure out how to best implement this. So um, we're not really far behind the curve, but I wouldn't say we're ahead of the curve either. Um, so this is just an example of two different data sets, totally different collection methodologies, population census, economic census. But like Josh was saying, um, it can go a lot further than that um, with Earth observation data, with more of the physical geography things that um, would be more in interesting for uh, issues like climate change and, and so forth. Um, so, the, again, the issue is it should serve as a common bridge um, because our each geographic container or unit that we currently have has a certain implied use um, that so they'll normalize by population, they'll normalize by number of employees or something like that, and that isn't always easy to integrate together. Um, so this is offered to be a more neutral um, unit. And Josh also talking about the null and zero values. So. Um, this is a this is a really uh, important element of of grids from a geographic standpoint. I know statistics, uh, you know, statisticians, they work, you know, they like to work where there's a lot of data. Um, but there's also in the, just a simple geographic sense, um, there's also areas where there just is no data. So our colleagues in New Zealand put together this map of. Um, New Zealand <laughs> on a one kilometer grid cell showing just how much of that country is uh, empty, has no housing. Um, and on the left side, you see equivalent uh, for Vermont, although the colors are switched, so sorry about that. But, but you can see Vermont is one of our most rural states, um, so people might think there's a lot of empty land, uh, but in fact, Vermont doesn't have the same kind of, uh, you know, uh, distribution of population as New Zealand does. Even most of Vermont at the one kilometer scale has some people in it. So again, apologies for the, the colors being switched. You have to kind of use, you know. <laughs> um, and then one of the, so we're talking about international comparisons. So one of the things that is difficult when doing international comparisons is again, even within a single point in time, um, the units that are used in one country are not at all equivalent spatially to the units used in another country. Um, and so it, in order to say, if, if one wanted to make a comparative study of a certain kind of neighborhood in Sydney versus London, um, using the local geographic uh, administrative units as your um, sampling frame or, the, you know, wh whatever it is you want to call it to compare uh, might not always work very well. But if we had a, a standard size grid uh, globally, you could say, all right, I want to look at a, a similar, um, you know, density grid cell in Sydney versus London. And then again, you can just see how the pattern of settlement varies differently in, in these different areas. Um, so we've been looking a lot at other, what other countries are doing. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe you'll be surprised, maybe not. Um, but um, as we get into talking about what kind of size we want, um, there does seem to be a kind of de facto standard uh, around the world going on right now, um, which is most of the agencies, most of the international organizations, most of the national statistical organizations that are using grid cells are kind of coalescing around this one kilometer square size. Um, and I don't think that's simply an accident. Um, so I think that 
we, we've had, you know, we've obviously had requests for different size grids, lots of different um, uh, agencies, lots of different uh, programs use very different size grids from down to, you know, one meter grids all the way up to like 100 kilometer grids. But there's a reason, I think, why the one kilometer grid is kind of an intuitive um, unit, an intuitive scale for human um, for, for human statistics, such as a Census Bureau produces. Um, it has to do with, you know, how, how far a census can perceive sight and sound, and a one kilometer just kind of fits naturally into what we would naturally consider our immediate surroundings. Um, you know, it, you, you can quibble with it here and there. I mean, you know, when you're inside, obviously it's a lot lower. When you're out in the Great Plains, you maybe you'll hear a bell from like 10 kilometers away. But, but generally, it kind of coalesces around this size. Um, so currently, um, we are looking at different options. I mean, there's many different grid cells out there. Um, and these are all, um, the, the, the picture in the middle is our tabulation blocks. And on the left is a hexagonal grid, and on the right is a, is a, a rectangular grid. Um, so right off the bat, you can just see, just, just from an aesthetic standpoint, or from a clarity of, of data standpoint, you can see how much easier it is to see patterns using this grid, patterns of uh, population um, versus our, our tabulation blocks. So just as a, you know, a, a naive, like, simple user, someone who just wants to understand where people are, in an area, this is an advantage. But, but we can see also there's, you know, there are slight differences uh, in what happens when you go from a square to a hexagon, both aesthetically and in terms of where the data is going to go. Um, but so we're looking at all these options now, and um, we're looking to, you know, for, for you guys' assistance in, in helping us make these decisions as well. Um, so I think I'm going to turn it back to Josh. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the project and how we're moving ahead because, again, this is a new geography. We're still kind of in the R&D testing phase, as Shona was mentioning. And so uh, just to give you an idea of what we're doing kind of behind the scenes. So we have an executive advisory uh, team. So those are, um, you know, uh, managers within uh, the geography division and the DITD, our information technology division. Uh, and they've been kind of leading us in this. Uh, Project management team, that's myself, Shonen, and, uh, and two of our colleagues, uh, Mohammed Samamra and uh, Janie Forbes. Uh, and then we've kind of broken out these different um, research uh, areas into to four phases right now, or four different work streams. One is the statistical content, and that's really looking at, uh, you know, given a certain geospatial frame, um, how do we get the statistics into that grid? And so we have uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Scott Holan, uh, Shumendra Lahiri, uh, Ryan Janicki, and others who are really looking at that just statistical methodology piece. We've got a communications team um, that's primarily uh, geography folks, but we've got some other uh, people on that team from other parts of the Bureau. And that's really looking at, you know, how do we communicate this? How do we interface with stakeholders? Um, because that's been a really big part of our uh, research is, is hearing from the public and interfacing with them. Geospatial properties is really uh, what we were talking about at this point. This is, I, I think, the, the uh, piece that is really we're moving uh, the most quickly with um, in terms of, you know, what size grid cell should we be looking at, the geometry, do we want square, hexagonal, you know, all there are a lot of different configurations that we have uh, to look at, and we're doing a lot of prototyping right now, as Shona just showed in the last slide, and that's really involved with our technical development team, which is really the, our IT staff, because we really, we don't want this to be something that we build on a, somebody's laptop and just put out. We want to make sure that this is getting built into our standard geospatial processes in the geography division and IT's um, standard production cycle. We don't want this to be something that gets segregated off. We want this to become an a integral part of, of our operations. And then we are, have been uh, in discussions with uh, folks from the disclosure area, and so we're really going to be moving very clo 
very soon into a uh, presentation with our Disclosure Review Board. Uh, the standards is also, there are a lot of uh, geospatial standards that we're looking at now and statistical standards. We're going to get that team going. And then the data storage and retrieval. As soon as we actually have a unit that we're looking at and test data that we're putting in beyond what we've already put together, we really need to think about how we serve this data up. Where does it get stored? And that's what this data storage and retrieval is going to be looking at, of just how do we maintain this data set. Um, so again, just a high-level roadmap of where we are right now. We're starting to head towards the finalization of our initial requirements gathering um, and the attributes and data selection. With this first grid that we're putting out, this first product, what is it going to look like? What's going to be in that grid? Um, and we'll be moving uh, on with that. Um, just in terms of accomplishments, I know we're over time. And just to be brief, I just want to make sure that uh, the point is made that we've really been doing a lot of outreach. And, and in the past year, we've been really actively working on getting out in front of as many groups as we can. Uh, I know here it says 21 events. I, I think we've had a lot more informal events as well, uh, lots of webinars, lots of calls. Um, we've even been meeting with uh, uh, colleagues from international uh, uh, statistical bodies and um, you know OGC, ISO, those kinds of groups but also other statistical agencies. Next week we have a, a meeting with uh, Mexico Zanehi to talk about their grids. We've been meeting with uh, Statistics Canada regularly and a lot of uh, other uh, uh, statistical agencies. Um, and uh, uh, just to put in the plug that we have uh, secured uh, space in the EDL, the Enterprise Data Lake, that's where we've been doing development now to do testing. That's where the Bureau is moving and we're, we're in there as well. Um, uh, I think this is mostly reiterating points that we've made already, but just I, I don't want to lose sight of this disclosure avoidance. We recognize that as being uh, one of our major challenges, um, and we will be, uh, we are already, and will be in the near future, uh, really tackling that. Uh, and then we're at questions. I think we're next going to pivot to Hannah. Is that what? So thanks, everybody. I'll just take the opportunity to say thank you very much. Thanks for requesting us to be here. We really appreciate it, and we're looking forward to all the feedback. So thank you very much for your time. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll just move right along. My name is Hannah Rosenblum, and I'm a geographer in the Census Bureau's International Program Center. Today, I'm going to talk about DemoBase, our international gridded population mapping program, and specifically a recent project on the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Zambia. Next slide, please. So um, first, an introduction to the International Program Center. The U.S. Census Bureau produces international data products for over 200 countries. We have experts conducting studies into demographic, economic, geographic, health, and aging issues. One of our oldest products is International Database, which has been active since the 1980s. We also produce detailed subnational population data sets, including population estimates for geospatial analysis. The two products highlighted on this slide are our collection of global subnational population data in the upper image and DemoBase, our gridded disaggregated population product in the lower image. Next slide, please. So, census and survey data are reported by areas such as the As we know, disasters and humanitarian crises do not Hannah, you are cutting in and out. Oh, could you turn off your video? I did turn off my video. Yeah. Is it any better if I speak closer? I think so, yes. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I'll start from the beginning of the slide. So, um, Census and survey data are reported by administrative areas, which I'll call ADM1 and ADM2, that's states and counties. As we know, disasters and humanitarian crises usually do not fit into administrative boundaries. Gridded mapping disaggregates administrative data into pixels. Um, and gridded population estimates can then be summed for any geographic region, such as a disaster-affected area. Next slide, please. 
Oh, why does the U.S. Census Bureau produce international gridded population? This program began in 2005. A National Research Council report called for the Census Bureau to integrate demographic data and remote sensing to produce high-resolution population estimates for populations at risk of humanitarian disasters. This demo-base has created gridded population data sets of Haiti, Pakistan, Rwanda, South Sudan, the Bahamas, Dominica, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The Haiti project established the relationship between built-up areas and population density. Since then, we have refined our methods. Next slide, please. Our current sponsor is the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, also known as PEPFAR. Their interest is in knowing how to direct their resources based on population. For this iteration of the project, our goal was to determine whether the combination of de demographic methods of population projection and top-down gridded population distribution methods can produce comparable results to that of a microcensus, which is a novel bottom-up method. If so, this could result in cost savings for gridded population estimate producers and or their beneficiaries. And to clarify, in top-down mapping, you start with the population total for an area and using ancillary data sets and modeling, distribute the population down to pixels. In bottom-up mapping, you start with the population of only a few small areas and basically use ancillary data sets and modeling to estimate outwards or upwards from those areas. Next slide, please. For this specific project, we began by focusing on the Copper Belt region, which for the purposes of this project includes Haut-Katanga and Lualaba provinces in southern DRC, as well as all of Zambia. One thing that is a little bit confusing is that there is a Copper Belt province in northern Zambia, but when I say region, I mean this entire area in gray, and when I mean the province, I will specify. The entire cross cross-border copper belt region is geologically rich in copper, cobalt, and other minerals. Mining of these materials has influenced the demographic composition of the area. We later expanded our work to all of DRC and Zambia. One thing that I want to note is that DRC's last census was in 1984, while Zambia completed a census in 2022. Unfortunately, the final results from Zambia's most recent census were not available while we worked on this project, so we projected forward from their 2010 census. Next slide, please. Here is a brief overview of our demographic methods. First, we looked at population growth rates in Zambia where there is more reliable data. We focused on the Copper Belt province, which we hypothesized could be a corollary to the copper-focused areas and we reviewed various all DRC estimates. We attempted to compare the DRC Copper Belt region provinces to the Zambia Copper Belt province, but realized they were not similar enough to draw conclusions. Based on that lack of similarity and ambiguity of data, we used constant growth rates. I'll go into more detail in the following slides. Next slide, please. So like I said, we started by looking at the Copper Belt province in Zambia its share of the population had decreased. And more closely, we noticed lower than average fertility. Some of this is made up for by migration, and that migration is mostly young men coming to work in the mines or related industries, not entire families. The image shows a couple of men coming up from Big Shift Mine carrying cobalt. Next slide, please. So the Copper Belt provinces in DRC, Katanga and Lualaba, were created from the former Katanga mega province seen in the southeast of this map. With the exception of the 1984 census, subnational data prior to 2015 are typically only available for the 11 original mega provinces. Um, for instance, in the graph, there is a compilation of provincial fertility estimates from a variety of sources, including the DHS, Mix, Census, and Sociodemographic Survey. In both 1955 and 1984, Katanga's reported fertility, which is in the bold line, 
was among the highest of all provinces. In 2001, Katanga fertility was closer to the national average, and in 2007, survey data suggests it was among the DRC's lowest, second only to Kinshasa. Thereafter, according to the most recent surveys, Katanga fertility was again among the highest. All in all, these findings stand in contrast to those of Zambia's Copper Belt province and raise doubts that Katanga's population share should have shrunk over time. Despite all the uncertainties, it seems that the natural growth rates were higher than average in the deep, than in, in the DRC overall. Next slide, please. Um, so the available evidence is ambiguous based on evidence of the Copper Belt province in Zambia, one could assume that similar dynamics would lead to slower than average population growth in the copper producing area of the DRC. In contrast, evidence on fertility trends suggest higher birth rates in Katanga along with its four constituent idiom ones. Um, so we use constant growth rates across the DRC. Next slide, please. However, we needed um, more detailed data than ADM1 for DRC. So to get to the next administrative level, we used the 1984 census data, the OCHA Common Operational Data Set, building counts calculated from the Google Open Buildings data set, and built up pixels from the European Space Agency World Cover data set. We found the proportion of building counts built up land cover pixels and COD estimates relative to their respective provincial total. These proportions were averaged and then multiplied by the ADM1 total population to create the ADM2 estimates. And on the right side, I have some example building footprints on the top and a land cover sample on the bottom. Next slide, please. Um, so then we took the population estimates and the ancillary data sets and put them into a random forest model. Um, this basically creates a density surface in which each pixel and the original population estimates uh, that we started with uh, were disaggregated back onto the pixels based on their weight. For the ancillary data, we always use a mix of anthropomorphic and physical data sets. For this particular project, they included airports, buildings, uh, cell towers, educational facilities, health facilities, elevation, land cover, precipitation, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, nighttime lights, rivers, roads, and soil moisture. Slide, please. Thank you. Um, so for the 2022 all DRC, all Zambia gridded population data sets, the model performed well with 90% of variance explained. The resulting data set demonstrates large portions of the DRC population live clustered near bodies of water, such as the Congo River along the northwestern part of the country and lakes in the northeastern part of the country. Similarly, there is a high density of population in the far west of the country near the Atlantic Ocean. And within Zambia, the capital Lusaka is very densely populated. The population is moderately settled through a north-south uh, path through the country. And the, the Trans-African Highway Network now follows this path. Um, we did notice that um, some of the important variables were distance to build up, which is intuitive, and distance to snow. Um, these are broken out from the land cover data set. There are some places in this region where it might be snow that is um, important, but also sometimes with imagery, snow and uh, cleared land are both very bright. So it might be that some cleared land that actually is associated with people um, was causing that to be classified as an important variable. Next slide, please. So we conducted a comparison to other highly modeled data sets. Uh, here I am comparing DemoBase, LandScan, which is from the Oak Ridge National Lab, and Grid3 slash WorldPop. I do want to point out um, some differences. Clearly, they all agree on the general pattern that LandScan is at one kilometer spatial resolution, while 
We and uh, World Pop are at 100 meter spatial resolution. You can see that they both have uh, white space while we do not. This is because um, we distribute the remainder population as very low values, whereas the other two constrain, in this case, constrain their data sets to building footprints. Um, there are studies that have found that data sets that constrain population to built up areas are likely to underestimate rural and overestimate urban populations because small settlements can go undetected. Um, and also building footprint, constraining to buildings requires building footprints and building footprints um, require very high resolution satellite imagery. And um, buildings can be obstructed by landscapes such as heavy forest and go undetected. Um, and buildings constructed with natural materials are difficult to discern, um, such as in this region where homes are constructed with um, mud or wild grasses as roofing material. Next slide, please. Um, in conclusion, using a combination of demographic methods of population projection and top-down gridded population distribution methods, um, we can, can we can produce high quality results um, that are at a lower cost to that of a micro census. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you for your attention. Um, we have both demo-based data and lots of other international data on our website at census.gov slash international programs. And next slide. And questions, are there other data sets we should be considering as inputs and is there a difference in how data users would interpret results uh, generated from a grid as opposed to that of census polygons. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the speakers. This is Jay Bright and I'd like to recognize our CSAC discussant Deborah Balk. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. <clears throat> so um, I'll be presenting on behalf of our, um, our group and uh, uh, in like the th uh, three of you presenting, um, where I'm going to share some of the presentation with um, some of our um, some of the CSEC members. So I'll turn it over shortly after making some initial comments to both uh, Seth and Lance. So, um, but I'd like to thank Josh, uh, Shonen, and uh, Hannah for these presentations. And um, let me just, if I could have the next slide, please. Just uh, like congratulations. It's about time. I. I Oh, how's that? Okay, great. So, sorry. Um, so, um, and yes. So, uh, I think that the rationale for this format is really hot, you know, very, very high and long overdue. Um, and as you pointed out, but really as climate change and disasters become increasingly common and preparing to avoid them, you know, census data products with flexible and I'm going to come back to this point a lot, flexible geographies will become increasingly needed. Um, I would not say that, and, and I know that you, you gave us presentation, you showed us the very small handful of other national statistical offices that produce censuses. Um, I think that, you know, it's true, some, a few have been doing it for a while, very few haven't, but I think this is an opportunity for real leadership on the part of the um, U.S. Census Bureau. And, um, also to say that it's not just disasters. People in uh, geographers have used these data for a very long time, public health and so on as well, or scientists who aren't interested in climate. These are data that they will use, and if they don't have them, they might make them up. Um, and therefore, it's really important that, um, you know, to take some leadership here. Um, so, um, and I would, but I would disagree with, uh, I think a lot of countries have used, I would say half of the countries on your list are using something smaller than a kilometer um, for their, the list you gave us. It was either 250 meters or 500 meters. Um, the questions you asked, next slide please. The questions you asked us were whether you should focus on a stable one kilometer equal area square quadrilateral grid. Um, whether you, you're, you were thinking about alternative gridding systems, the geographic space and the geometry question as well, um, or to move toward a national grid. For those of you who use the you know, geographic data, you know that in the US, we, every state has its own you know, geography, and so there are some issues there. 
And then one uh, potential issue with the disclosure, and uh, my takeaway point on this is this is an opportunity to improve on disclosure issues, not the opposite. So I see this as a real opportunity to do um, to hit that nail on the head. Um, so if I could have the next slide, and I'll address those um, independently. Um, I'll take a pause. This is not on a slide. I just want to say that I'm, most of the remarks I'm going to make now are with respect to the U.S. grids. For those of you who, rather than the International Programs um, Project, and Hannah, uh, with no disrespect to the work that you've been doing, but these are too much, for those of you who don't live in this grid space, these are two much different types of initiatives. The global grids, as I understand it, are produced by stakeholder demand, fall in a tradition of technical assistance, and there's been a long tradition of global grids as a way to get around issues of um, data sharing and um, and some underlying um, additional issues. So the earliest global grids produced by Waldo Tobler initially as gridded population of the world in, in the late 1990s was to get around the fact that um, many countries, never the United States, did not allow their spatial data to be shared. Now there, so, and, th uh, and therefore, almost all of the global grids are a solution to um, consistency between countries, not necessarily on inputs, but on outputs, and therefore being able to, and making something available for every country in the world seamlessly. But that's a different objective than the one that the U.S. global grid can, um, that uh, the, the approach taken by national statistical offices. So I think it's really important that we, in our comments and, and advice to you, recognize these are, two, they may have two much different objective sets. I mean, yes, improve data, uh, availability, but um, but in many in different domains. So um, because the global grid products often arose out of something like what we might call a bad data problem, um, and this is not the case of the um, development of the grids for the um, from within the the bureau for the U.S. itself. So I'd like to ask a little bit more about the underlying data, which is, you know, what census data products um, do you envision using? We didn't hear about them. I'm particularly interested in the thematic breadth that, you're, um, that you will cover. Um, population and housing counts are mentioned, but not population by age, sex, and race. And I would argue there's a very high need for those. Um, uh, and as we know, at the block level data, at least with the public law, the public law release, right? It was over 18 and above in a single unit. And I would really, and I, anybody who does work on health or who uses these kind of data for denominators or, or on schooling, I mean, these are not the best, um, uh, breakdowns for us as a, a population. So, and, and it's not, there's both by sex, age, and race. I would like encourage strong, you know, gridded products that allow us, and if you don't want to do single year age, fine, but at least have your under ones in a single population, have, think about school age bins as well as um, for old, older ages, you know, above, it may be worthwhile to break up people over 65 as we're an aging population and to keep tabs on the growth in those populations. So um, housing tenure, we're a census of population and housing. There's a lot, and housing and population do not always um, track exactly. So I, I, it's really important, particularly in the context of disasters. We learned a lot, we talked a lot about housing yesterday. So I think there's a way to, if you, we want to understand we don't want to assume they, they're always tracking. And if they're diverging, we want the tools to be able to understand that. We collectively, that is. So uh, there are many other variables that also would be really be great to have education, poverty statistics, new poverty statistics, uh, linguistic isolation, so on and so forth. The list can go on and on. Uh, also, um, I heard you talk about updates to series, but I didn't hear anything about annual products or, um, or like, for example, and back to the what data sources, are you going to use the decennial census as the base? Are you going to use them? Um, but the ACS and a lot of the census data products, right, they all start with individuals, so they can be combined in new ways um, that would produce, might also allow for a very attractive Frequency of updates, as you may know, if you work in the world of gridded population, a lot of times you'll be asked, like LandScan, uh, the LandScan data provider pr produces a, an ambient population 
which is where the population of a particular grid cell is on average within 24 hours. And this is done as a way of getting around the, um, the de jure population where you slept on the night of April 1st, or April 15th, sorry, right? So, um, right, our census day. So we want to know, uh, what, 20? April 1. It was April 1. It was April 1. I had it I had it right the first time, but then I like, yes, okay. Then I was like, oh, no, 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 maybe that's April Fool's Day. So, right. So the idea, so, I, and, and I, but I would argue, don't, don't go straight to ambient population. Landscan already produces that. They have a model. Let them continue to produce it. Um, I think that what could, there is information in many of the data sources that are in your disposal to think about are thinking about seasonal populations and thinking about daytime populations. And those are two really important, um, uh, and you know, so think about those as themes that could be, um, uh, that could evolve out of a blended gridded product. So, um, and then uh, you didn't also mention the historic data, though you did mention how how you can go forward and I mean how you can make change over time but going back is really important as we go ahead and change the way we um, think about uh, the urban classification or the fact that blocks have changed they change every they change constantly right having something that goes back in time is equally important as something that goes forward in time so and again, I'm reminding you that, you know, I mean, I don't have to remind you, but like you have the ingredients to do this better than anybody possibly could from the outside. Now, having said all that, um, we think that you should um, think about a flexible spatial scale. I would like to give you some pushback to the notion that um, one kilometer is really what people want. Um, I don't really, or it's the standard. I think in this urban world, it is not the standard. I mean, you know, the 80 some percent of the US population lives in urbanized areas, and those places need something finer than a kilometer for the most part. Um, it's just, um, and, and in fact, you know, Close to you know, 20 years ago, season uh, the, at Columbia University produced using the block level data variable grids for the U.S. They produced for the 50 largest MSAs a 250 meter grid, um, and so um, and then one kilometer for the rest of the country. So, I would recommend thinking about something that's variable, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but. So I would think about something that's like fixed grid system altogether is not exactly what you want. You want something that you really uses the real deal ingredients and then something that uses, you know, like the, the next point up there is I can avoid because I, I made it already. Um, but you, so, but just a, again, a reminder, because you have the inputs, you can be very creative with the outputs. Um, and um, I would allow you to think, I would suggest you to think about what users, um, what spatial units are relevant for users um, and potentially create a product that allows them to do some of this on the fly, which would then mean you're creating an app of sorts. And there are a lot of people who are already doing this in the gridded, in the global gridded space. So um, lastly, you, uh, not lastly, but I was gonna turn it over to Seth in a minute and I know we're nearing our public comments, so maybe we'll pause to, to do that. But um, the hex, I would just like to caution about the hexagonal grids. I mean, they look nice. I think they, they're not as intuitively understood. They're harder for users to understand. And I and maybe they're a fad, maybe they're fantastic. I don't know. You know, Waldo Tobler also liked pycnophylactic smoothing and okay, try to spell it, right? It was not popular. It has never been reproduced. It's a clever idea because it takes into account the characteristic of the neighboring areas that, um, but um, not not one that was well adopted. And so I know there are members of the global community that like hexagons. Um, if you want a hexagon product in addition, but I would not make that your go-to grid. Um, um, so um, do we have? T should I continue? Okay. So Seth, I'm gonna. Um, I, uh, yeah, so it, take it away. We're all, we're going to talk for a moment about alternative to fixed grids. Yeah. Okay. Tom, Tommy Wright. It is now time for public comment. Uh, during this meeting, I will verbally present public comments that were submitted in writing. Anyone who would like to submit public comments after the meeting, the Federal Register notice located at the committee's website provides more information 
on submitting written comments. We have received three written comments. Two were submitted before the deadline. I will read those two all, uh, as I mentioned, on the committee's website. Uh, public comment number one uh, by Adele Wilcox. The American Community Survey race question directs the respondents to mark one or more boxes and print origins. This instruction misleads respondents. Probably few respondents are aware that the ACS race and ethnicity data may be used in redistricting litigation. ACS race data are tabulated differently from PL 94-171 race data. Table 27 in official California redistricting documentation, there's a reference, illustrates that the ACS citizen voting age population special tabulation is not equivalent to PL 94171 data. CVAP documentation, there's a reference, shows that only four combinations of two races are tabulated. All other ACS respondents who mark more than one race are collapsed into the category called remainder of two or more race responses. Further, Ricardo Lowe, Jr. reported that the U.S. Census Bureau coding of race origin write-in response values may lead to recoding people who identify as monoracial into a multiracial category. There is a reference. The Committee on National Statistics Panel to evaluate the quality of the 2020 Census also documented this. There's a reference. I will not address this complex issue further here. ACS respondents who want to give race response values useful to redistricting litigation should mark only one box and lead all race and Hispanic origin right in fields blank. If the ACS race question is not reworded for 2025, the U.S. Census Bureau should publish a notice to ACS respondents on their website. The, the, the second uh, public comment, and there is a much longer version on uh, the website. In fact, in this particular case, the, the, the person submitted a short version and a long version. I will read the short version. The Census Bureau, a short form comments of the Coalition of Human Needs. The Coalition on Human Needs makes two recommendations to the Census Bureau. First, we are deeply concerned by the proposal to create the master address file entirely in office and by the lack of any information in the presentation slides on how the in-office approach would locate hidden housing units. We oppose this recommendation until the Bureau can fully inform the committee and the public about how it plans to make sure that the master address file is more complete than it was in 2020 when it was deeply flawed. The Bureau's on real-time 2020 administrative census revealed that 23.1 million people lived at about 18 million addresses that either were not in the master address file at all, were wrongly categorized as uninhabitable, or were categorized as buildings that were not residential. As a result, they did not get census forms and were not counted. We want to point out several critical considerations. Number one, because housing costs have risen dramatically in the last few years, the number of hidden housing units has probably grown a lot since 2020. Number two, children are particularly likely to live in these hidden housing units because the child poverty rate is higher than any other age group. A master address file that fails to include these places will contribute to the significant undercount of young children. Number three, other historically undercounted populations are also more likely to be poor and thus also more likely to be living in these hidden housing units. Towards the end, 
Secondly, as the Bureau develops the news survey, we urge the Bureau to consider using administrative records to add missing people to improve the household rosters. The survey is designed to measure poverty because poverty is determined by size of household as well as income. When the roster is incomplete, a poor household may appear not poor. We also believe this approach should be considered for current surveys, particularly the ACS. But it is especially important to make sure when the Bureau is creating a new survey that it will be the best possible job of counting everyone. That concludes what I'm going to share with everyone. I think we can resume uh, the discussion. Seth, I believe. I think yeah thanks so so just to sort of uh, connect back just to sort of maintain some continuity uh, in the previous slide Deborah sort of introduced the idea that um, that rather than sort of defining a geography and then sort of filling it with data you could think about what the needs of the data user community are what the privacy constraints are and to sort of create geographies that are designed flexibly um, based on what the data will bear and, and what the constraints are. Um, so there are alternatives to this kind of fixed geographic approach. Um, the, the, uh, and just sort of, you know, historical sort of uh, uh, trivia is that, you know, when census tracts were first uh, proposed by Walter Laidlaw, who was his Presbyterian minister in New York, um, he originally proposed a gridded system of census tracts, not the kind of funny shaped things that we're used to. Um, we ended up with the funny shaped things that, we're, that we, we're used to now because the New York sort of Department of Health or Sanitary Engineering, I forget exactly what it was called, had these these already drawn things, and he just decided to use them for tabulating the 1900 census. Um, it, it wasn't the original design. Um, so, um, the value, so, so part of the reason that we think grids are valuable is that um, we agree with the presentation. We think that they are stable, that having geographic units for the, that are defined for the purposes of statistical tabulation, that are conditional on the built environment, um, makes things difficult because as the built environment changes, your statistical units have to change. And, and there's not a clear reason why, you, why the units for statistical tabulation need to be tied to the built environment. Moreover, um, you, you know, we think that if you care about historical comparability and stability, um, grids are superior. Um, second, uh, the second advantage of grids is that we think they're really easy. That data integration with grids, um, as was shown in the presentation, you know, can be a lot easier um, than data integration across sort of other types of heterogeneous geographies. Um, this is true if, uh, if these grids are appropriately defined. Um, we also think that grids can actually make life a lot easier for tabulation, and in particular, as we sort of move into a very sort of heterogeneous information landscape, not just in, for the Census Bureau, but for anybody, um, there are ways to define grids that allow them, that allow you to rapidly tabulate information to grids, you know, such that you can process billions of records in minutes and, and assign them to grids. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and, and lastly, we think grids are flexible, that, that there are gridding systems that are inherently multi-scale, so that rather than having to use the fixed geography, you can use these multi-scale grids in a way that allows you to very easily operationalize those principles of using the geographic unit that, you know, that the data will bear, that privacy constraints will bear, that data users need, and so on. Um, just to sort of show you some of the flexibility of grids, there's a large sort of, you know, open source community of people who design things for the gridding system that I'll talk about in a second on the next slide. But this picture on the left, I think this is Singapore, and this is just showing how the, um, this particular gridding system uh, allows you to sort of, you know, adapt grids to any sort of geography that you can sort of pack 
any arbitrary geography with grids and, and get estimates. So rather than a geography just being, you know, a list of latitude and longitude coordinates, it can actually just be a list of, of grid cells and you can tabulate and deal with things in multiple scales. Next slide, please. Um, so what we think is nicer than using hexagons or uh, a sort of projected gridding system is this technique called a geohash. A geohash is a, is, a, is a way of producing a hash, sort of like a, a, um, a, a code that uniquely identifies a latitude and longitude pair. So given any latitude and longitude pair, you can rapidly produce a geohash. Um, and you can do this you know, on a mobile phone, you can do this anywhere, you can do you know, millions of records very quickly. Uh, uh, it, 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 and it, it's, it's efficient and widely used. So one of the nice properties of these, of these hashes, if you look at this picture uh, on the, I don't do right and left well, <laughs> on the right side of the slide, um, there are, uh, we have a bunch of latitude and longitude pairs, and then we have these codes, those funny numeric codes. Those funny numeric codes are the hash, and you can see that um, if we look at the code, you know, it says 9V66F, it's a little bit of an eye test for me, um, and 9V66F is a grid cell, it's that blue grid cell. And then within that grid cell, as we add letters, we actually add geographic resolution. So we get, like the Tiger system, which has this kind of hierarchical thing, these geo hashes have within them this hierarchical representation. Um, because the grid is mathematically defined, you don't need a GIS software or GIS expertise to work with the grid. Anybody with a latitude and longitude, any data that can be defined anywhere on the surface of the Earth can be moved in and out of this gridding system. Um, uh, finally, I, the, the last uh, thing I'll say about this is that um, the, this hashing approach allows you to turn very, ge allows you to take, uh, to, to locate geographically precise information to a grid cell, but if somebody has the grid cell, they can't recover back the precise information that was used to assign things to the grid. That is, if I were to give you only the letters, you know, 9V66F, you would know that's, that there, there was a person or an event somewhere within that grid cell. If I were to give you only the letters 9V, you would know there was a, a larger grid cell um, that you know, covered a larger area, but you would have no way of recovering the underlying precise information. So, so there are advantages, uh, you know, for um, privacy and, and the ability to do these kind of hierarchically sized things um, uh, means that you can sort of fit the scale to the problem. Uh, and uh, I guess th there's more to talk about here. This is, I could nerd up for a while, uh, but I'll pass it on to, I think, Lance. Thanks, Seth. Uh, the very last comment on that slide is just to reiterate that cell suppression rules or other um, aspects of disclosure avoidance could be applied to either the size of the grid cell, the size of the geohash, the resulting, like if a geohash um, system was put into place, or for any other grid prop grid cell, you can make the, if you like the idea of this variable grid, it can be responsive to disclosure issues um, from the design of it, if you want. And so we're going to now um, open it up to uh, Lance, going to uh, take the next slide. Yeah, thanks, Lance Waller, CSEC. Uh, one of the things that was really exciting about this particular meeting is all the presentations seem more connected. Maybe that means I've gone to enough meetings. <laughs> They're starting to make more sense, but I think I, I think it's more than that. I, I I do see these yeah I do see these interactions across things, and that's you know from the CSAC perspective really exciting that these aren't just individual things to be combined later. Um, so I think the umbrella of the statistics product first thinking, and I think Sally was right about saying this is you know bureau wide, covers a lot of ground, but it also encourages a lot of con of communication that's happening, and so you know kudos to that. Um, also, thinking of the grid as a statistical product or a framework for these statistical products is a really helpful way for me to, to think about this in general, too. So the idea of more flexible things is additional statistical products and flexibility to get them. The key point is, as these continue to develop and document this interoperability between the different initiatives and external competitor data sources, so like WorldPOP, we, you were comparing the results of WorldPOP to the results, 
But we'd also, and, and I know you've done this, it's just like part of the documentation be how are the ingredients different between the two? Because they're doing similar types of things, not exactly the same. And I was really encouraged yesterday in the description of how, um, in like working with housing, uh, initially going to Google to say, how are you doing this with the footprints? And then Google coming in, and, you know, it gets to be, at first it's a teach us how you're doing it, but then it becomes a partnership kind of um, component. So I think these aspect, and, you know, I think this is the way the world is going. The CN Stat uh, National Academy's report on blended estimates, the use of the discussion of use of administrative data throughout the presentations, uh, the Office of National Statistics in the UK, New Zealand, they're all looking at how do you put things together. So again, it's model what you can. You know, showing, the, the thing with gridded estimates is they look real. <laughs> and it's the validation component. You know, it has more geographic details. Surely it's better, but, you know, that some of the ground truth thing. So I do think there's an opportunity to do, and maybe this is outside the Bureau, but uh, an opportunity to take things like these international grids apply them to some of the areas in the U.S., you can do some ground truthing. Um, we've suggested this to, like, the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. And it, it sometimes it seems like a waste of time because you have a result that looks right. But let's, I, I think uh, the Bureau has this added responsibility because of its mandate. Um, but I think you can also be leaders in requesting that sort of documentation from your competitor partners. You know, it's, I, I think, what is the, the generalized... NIH has supported this development of data sharing repositories, and they call it coopetition. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a real word, but, um, you know, they work together but separately. But that, that trust but verify kind of, I think there's that kind of collaboration that uh, I think we'd really encourage. And we were getting into some details with the grids that I think are really important. Um, but it's, it's not for a lack of enthusiasm that we're headed in the right direction. It's just... Part of our, our charge is to want to see the see under the rug. So, thanks. Great. Thanks, Lance. Um, a few more comments, and then we'll wrap up. Um, and so uh, we ended up on the, you know, you showed us your impressive uh, overarching statistic on stakeholder requirements gathering, but you didn't tell us any of the content, and um, I was left wondering more, wanted to hear more about it. Um, and so, um, as well as not just like what the current users use, but like did you talk to people who might want to use this if they knew they could use it, that kind of thing. Um, and so, and I don't know that the global gridded data users and the national gridded data users are the same, so I think you, they may be different engagements. Um, and I think, you know, this comes up both with the presentation you guys gave us as well as Hannah, the one you gave us on what kind of user guidelines will users need and, um, you know, expected software interfaces for these data products is um, the way the global community is going. So um, you might, again, the flexible grids could be put up by a data interface on your end. Um, and GIS presents a hurdle for some statistical data users, um, but increasingly software like Python and R um, handle raster data sets, so, and the Census Bureau is doing more with making R code available, so just keep doing it, do more of it. Uh, that's all I can say. It'll make it, these data products, it'll demystify them. Um, I also think, and I'll get, well, I'll get to that in a second, a very, um, the questions on the global grids, um, there were two on other data sets, I think that's, a. Uh, you maybe have too many data sets if you ask me, not um, whether you need more, but uh, there's always the issue of potential endogeneity in a random forest, and random forests are not, um, you know, we don't necessarily know what's driving the, you know, we know the overall variation, but not the specifics of whether or not we're just seeing people live near rivers because we put the rivers in there. I mean, partly, I mean, people do live near rivers, we know that, but... Um, so anyway, but there's but there is some endogeneity concerns, um, and um, I repeat what um, Lance just said about the if those um, really excellent grids for the U.S. would be an opportunity to look at the global data products and ground to have some real um, cross validate not cross validation but to use as a standard by which to check on those global data products, especially over time. My sense is that over time they take coarser units and reallocate them to the same spatial distribution. So if those spatial distributions are changing, you can lead that conversation and that would be great. Um, uh, so um, I, uh, I do think that in the public presentation of all this stuff, being clearer 
um, to the on what the difference is between the U.S. Global Grid Initiative and the global, uh, the U.S. and the Global Data Product Initiatives are. The global ones, they, I really do think they serve much different objectives. There could be increased linkages. I, I'm not even sure if the in the presentation, Hannah, that you gave us, whether the um, the the data set, um, yeah, the well, that the data set that the data set that you oh sorry, could you go to the next slide? I didn't ask. I'm looking at it on my computer because I can't. Well, these ones I can read, but some of them um, some of them are too small for my own. Um, sorry, uh, and I'm I think I'm not the only one in the room who can't read these. So, um, but um, the the global data products, I, I wasn't sure if in the like the example that you gave us for um, DRC in Zambia, whether you're producing that it's a technical assistance project or you're doing it because they're not doing it. And um, so, to the extent where it is technical assistance, and to the extent that I in okay in the case of Congo where there's no hasn't been a census since 1984, that's a big hurdle to overcome. Come, um, but technical assistance is another potential way to deepen the connection between these two products. But being very clear that they they're much different types of data products, I think will be will be very informative on how people can use them. Um, and I would also say that the global gridding community is largely a crowded field, but the national um, uh, homespun one is not. And again, more leadership is really great. Um, and if you could go to the next slide. Um, so, um, uh, I, of course, I, I encourage, you know, transparency everywhere that, you know, you, you can be transparent. Um, user guidance on how to use these grids is going to be important, um, including like what happens on the back end with map projections. You did ask us a very specific question about national grids. It's true that Alaska it, you might, we might need to treat Alaska different from the Continental 48 um, uh, because, and, and all the, the outlying islands because they are the, you know, the geography, the distortion will be greater in Alaska if you don't do something slightly different for Alaska. So um, we would need to address, you would need to address that. Um, but I think statistical users of map, of map projections is typically pretty weak. So any time there is geographic data that's that needs to be explained, you need to explain it. Like, you need, and including if people are going to transform the data, what kind of errors might be propagated by, by um, you know, reprojecting and so forth. Um, so guidance on how to use them is um, really great. I think is great, and um, and also how to you know repackaging them from back from the grid to some vector or tabular space that people are really happy um, with. So on the last slide, I just want to, again, keep up the good work. Um, and you have an opportunity to become a leader in the production of these. And, and we would encourage spatially flexible data products. Um, and I think there's no harm in embracing new methods where possible and where flexibility is what the downstream user wants. Um, maximize the potential of such new products as a means to maintain confidentiality. Um, and I, I think this will require a little bit more work on your part. Um, but also, you know, I saw, you know, you're planning on having that conversation, you know, the part the disclosure avoidance team can see this as an opportunity also. So I, I would encourage um, finding the uh, union of those two interests and uh, going forward with it. And please keep us posted on this, on your progress. Thanks, Deborah. This is Jay Bright again. Um, I've been informed we have an offline IT issue that is um, has a timely issue to it, so I ask for a very succinct response from the speakers. And then I think, as far as CSAC discussion, we've had the three um, folks weigh in, so unless you have something burning, I think we would go to break at that time. So, please. I, I guess I'll start, and if that's all right. Um, yeah, I wish we had had more time for the presentation because I think a lot of the questions could have been addressed. Uh, for example, the uh, different data that we're looking at producing age, sex, race. I mean, one of the uh, models that we're looking at just in terms of R&D and testing and prototyping is the SAPI program. Um, you know, looking at uh, under 18, uh, children under age, and then uh, over 65 and over as vulnerable populations. We thought that would be really great. Uh, just their complex... Uh, data sets already and you know how does that work with a grid um, and one of the reasons that we focused on that and SAPI in particular was because one of the groups that we've heard a lot of feedback from that we've actually got some of our most robust feedback uh, is the um, disaster response community specifically FEMA we got fantastic responses from FEMA 
Uh, and that was one of the things that they uh, asked for was, you know, vulnerable populations. What would that look like on a grid? They had some really excellent use cases of how they would actually apply a grid. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to pivot quickly to Seth's comments. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we're looking at this uh, kind of boring vanilla one kilometer square grid is uh, our long-term vision is that this is kind of the initial product that we're putting out. And we can build off of that. We can, we can then, you know, have smaller units, larger units. We can aggregate. But one kilometer seems like a good kind of pitch across the, the plate to get started with. <laughs> I, 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 the, the umpire shaking me off. But that's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll work through this. But that's, the, you know, that, that was really the idea is that we, we get this, this new product out, get reactions to it. If people say they don't like it, okay, how can we change that? We thought that one kilometer is a really good just starting place. And then to start to say, you know, how, how, are, how is this working for you? Do you need, you know, these other, do you need geohashing? Do you need some other unit? Um, one of the reasons we wanted to do that also is just for that stability. We don't want to come out of the gate with something that's so complex that it's not easily used by a broad swath of our data users. It doesn't, uh, it's something that's easily integratable, but uh, I guess we can, I, again, I could talk all day on some of these topics, but I yeah, should turn it over, Sean. I think there's a, there's a certain balance between um, the flexibility and creating a standard that can be broadly used and broadly understood as, uh, you know, applicable to the whole country and I think you know going with a with a, a rectangular or square you know a quadrilateral grid will certainly help with that because you you can have us uh, one kind of communication to one set of users that's this is an equal area uh, one kilometer for the whole nation and then you know I, I don't know exactly how you would communicate this but th th there's also a flexible product nested within that um, so I think that, you know, that's why, you know, a big reason why we didn't want to go with hexagons, for example, is it's, it's much harder to do that, that kind of work with that, so. Yeah, and, and, and just before we turn it over to the, the other uh, presenters, um, in terms of the stakeholders and who we've discussed with, so that 21 was really uh, webinars. It was, that was really uh, where we were, doing outreach. We've also had just technical discussions with a wide range of people, uh, including, you mentioned uh, Season, uh, Deborah, and we've been talking to Greg Yetman at Season. We've had multiple discussions with him um, and the uh, folks at Oak Ridge National Lab that are doing the land scan. Uh, you know, initially I thought maybe they would think that we're stepping on their turf. They were so excited. They were really glad to hear. Very supportive. Everybody's been really supportive of the, the project uh, overall. So we are talking to you know, not just the general public and, and general data users. We're really trying to talk to, uh, you know, grid specialists. I'm really glad we've got some in the house today, um, but I'll turn it over. Mario, do you have an urgent response? I'll just say Puerto Rico. <laughs> and FEMA. Thank you very much. So um, I think we need to close this session, given the time. And for um, Tommy... I'll turn it back over to Tommy Wright. Tommy Wright, thank you very much. Joshua, Sean, Hannah, Deborah, Seth, and Lance. I think this sets a record. <laughs> and of course the committee. Thank you very much. I think we're going to see grids in our future. That, that, that's what I think. We're going to now take a 10 minute, 10 minute break. Uh, and uh, after following that, the committee will assemble to continue work on recommendations. Thank you very much, everyone.
So, uh, CSAC members, uh, uh, one moment. <laughs> Just a quick announcement for CSAC members. We're, we're not all convened, but we soon will be. Um, we're having a bit of a, the breakout session now. So if you have comments on SIP Seamless, please talk to John, who is finalizing that section. Deborah will be back momentarily. She's finalizing her section on statistical grid. So if you have comments there. Um, once we get through um, uh, SIP Seamless, which I hope will be relatively quick, the bulk of us will be working through the recommendations top down. Um, in case any time it remaining uh, statistical grids might need additional time. So if they're still working on that, we'll get the bulk of us working on the rest of the stuff and then have them join in so that we can kind of parallel process. Okay? Um, I, that's, that's the vision. And I, I wasn't thinking that we would have, like, let's stop, go to lunch, come back. Um, there's a place right here. There's places around the corner. If you could grab stuff, bring it back in. Um, would be great. Just sort of working lunch at your um, discretion, hunger level, whatever. Okay? Oh, thank you. Thanks, Sean. All right, thanks.
So, um, CSAC members, um, I've added a little bit of introductory text in the intro intro about one-way briefings because we had several that came up as of interest and um, future topics. So if you have things that you think would fit up there, feel free to drop them in and we can. And you can move it out of your section if you had one in there because sometimes it showed up as a recommendation or things like that, but we can put them all together.
So um, everybody, I think we're ready to start with our top-down read-through. Um, so the I think the statistical grids team might still be working a bit. Is that true? I'm looking at Deborah. Um, are you guys still working on grids? Yeah. Okay. Clock is ticking, Deborah. All right. Um, so I think the rest of us will start working through top down through the recommendations. So maybe we can kind of gather over here a little bit and um, walk through them. Great. Um, let's see. So, Chris, I hope you can hear us. And we're going to start a walkthrough from the top. Okay, perfect. Great. Um, so we've got a little bit of introductory text about, you know, general thanks, and then two um, paragraphs, one referring to one-way briefings, where we need to be careful that one-way briefings are truly one-way briefings. They're supposed to provide further information um, using that mechanism when it might provide background or clarification on technical content that will then be followed up in a regular meeting, a public meeting. So it's not a way around the um, advisory committee purpose. And, but we did have a few topics that showed up during the course of this meeting where it would, they're obviously going to be coming up again. And 
you will want to have that technical content in hand. So follow-up one-way briefings seem to make a lot of sense. And I don't remember what they all were, but there's a placeholder right here to move stuff out of specific recommendations or anywhere else in the text they might be and just stick it as a list here. So we don't really want them as recommendations, but just as um, we'll just put the list up here and the advisory committee staff will keep track of that stuff on our behalf. So please, um, if you haven't already done so, move stuff up there. I know one had to do with the, um, the R code that was for the... Um, and there, and local privacy, was that yeah, part of that? Yeah. yeah, I think so. So any of those can get moved up there, um, and at any time. Jay, and then uh, this, the yeah, Chris, can you hear me? Yep. I, I put a suggestion about the news, and it really is a one-way briefing. It's more of a topic for the another future meeting. Really. Okay. Uh, um. So, Claire. Can, yeah, thanks, Chris. We'll get that over there. Claire, can you move that um, bullet to the... Um, so there's two pieces. One is one-way briefings, and the other is future presentations at CSAC meetings. So can you just move that up to the upper one? And I guess this should say presentations at future CSAC meetings or something. And then, Chris, you wanted to add something about news as a bullet under future presentations. Yes, future presentations about meetings. Okay, and do you want to just put a bullet? Um, do you see that fourth bullet under further CSAC is interested in future presentations? Just you can just add news right there. Okay. I'll um, uh, yeah, I'll put the text in there and I'll just move it over. Okay. Um, okay, so that's that's it for the introduction. Then we go into statistical product first, and I checked back in the presentations, and it's always statistical product first, and <laughs> not products. <laughs> so I, I was looking for that and trying to catch it where it was. Um, but this looked like it was in, in great shape, and I know it's had a lot of eyes on it. Um, so maybe we can just walk through recommendation by recommendation and see if we have agreement. Um, one, um, two very minor comments. <laughs> One is that during the course of my time as chair, I have tried to normalize that we are CSAC and not the CSAC, and I've tried to always say the Bureau and not the Census Bureau because um, it shows up so many times. So, um, but I, I accept if the will of the committee is that it be the Census Bureau, I'm okay with it. Um, but I tried to go through and delete all those. <laughs> so, up to you all. Yes. Yeah, John, that's for any of the topics that we identified. Because um, a few came up, but I don't remember what they were. Yeah, um, was, and I think you all remember, but we had more than one. And it wasn't just, I don't remember what they were. So we should just stick them up there. By the way, could people um, continue to use the mics? Because I couldn't hear that at all. Um, we're not oh. set up for mics. Yeah. We have a recommendation just by the way that meetings be all um, remote because, you know, we have a climate crisis and it's expensive and there's a whole bunch of reasons why it works really well and it's well and we should do it remotely. Just my suggestion. Yeah, Chris, the comment was had to do with um, what were the set of one-way briefings? Was there meant to be more than one bullet under the first um, topic about one-way briefings? So I was asking folks to move those up to that section. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So first recommendation under statistical product first. CSAC recommends that the Bureau proactively monitor the use of its data products down to the level of individual variables to better understand the needs of communities who do engage directly with the Bureau. AI-supported search procedures are one approach that might be used to identify this larger group. Any questions, comments? Um, understand the needs of communities who do not engage directly with the Bureau. Okay. <laughs> Good catch. Now, does anyone have objections to that one? Okay. 
Uh, number two, CSAC recommends that the Bureau maintain a list of high priority, high impact projects that are informed from and shaped by data user engagements. Okay. CSAC recommends that the Bureau compare the SPF guiding principles to the FCSM framework for data quality and consider expanding the guiding principles so that the FCSM dimensions are fully covered. All right. CSAC recommends that the Bureau formally evaluate SPF's user and data usage segmentation given its importance for effective outreach to data user, data user communities. Quick question, are these publicly available, these comments? If they are, we should use fewer abbreviations, fewer acronyms. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, actually, the, um, those acronyms have been defined above but um, we should be careful that we always do that because we always complain about it. So, um, but um, SP, they they have been defined on first use. So, um, but yeah, point well taken. Good principle. Okay. Um, so let's see. Yep. Then, um, so number five, CSAC recommends that Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders be treated separately from AIAN in the SPF demonstration product because these groups are treated differently under federal law. Um, CSAC recommends the Bureau partner and engage with tribal nations beyond conferences where tribal leaders and policy experts may encounter urgent competing policy agendas with other agencies and departments such as emergency management, economic development, and missing and murdered indigenous women, and consider more back and forth collaborations rather than presentations and listening sessions with limited tribal leader conversation. <laughs> um, CSAC recommends that the SPF initiative track and publicly report the communities that are served by data concierge services as well as those that are not. CSAC recommends the SPF initiative provide preferred citations for all statistical and data products as well as for open source code products. longer comments can you use a mic just so because Chris can't hear any of that I think sorry uh, after number eight I this might be a, a good one-way briefing request so I put one up there but I don't know if it's overkill to have a recommendation that they provide preferred citations and then uh, ask for a one-way briefing on what they are that's, maybe that's too much so I can take the one-way briefing back out and we'll just see what they okay. respond to this thanks uh, CSAC recommends the SPS SPF initiative report on the potential for delivering statistical products for novel geographically specific areas that would benefit from statistical tabulation, heretofore not well served by existing bureau geographies, blah, blah, blah. And Seth has a comment on whether we might delete this. Well, I just wasn't sure if, I, I don't disagree with the, with the comment and the sentiment. I just wasn't sure if it fit within the SPF kind of material or narrative. Do, do we know where this came from? I don't. Yeah, we were talking about it, but since this is like a bridge with the grids, the grids so we could say something like the SPF initiative and grids. Yeah, something could, could together inform something like that. Yeah, <clears throat> Some, that would make more sense, I think. And, and I think my when I was reading it this morning and I wrote that note, I think it's because I thought maybe it could go in the grids and yeah. I wasn't sure it felt maybe a little out of place. Yeah, I think it's fine to... So is the recommendation to... So my recommendation would be we move this to GRIDS okay. because GRIDS is its own initiative and SPF is an overarching one. So you say something in the GRIDS section about connecting with SPF. Okay. Yeah, I think that makes perfect that, that, sense. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. And user, user input in the GRIDS, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I'll, I'll move this highlighted section down to GRIDS and it'll come up again when we get down. <laughs> okay. How's that? Thanks. 
All right, number 10, CSAC recommends the Bureau provide a detailed explanation of their process for determining the privacy loss budget for the IRS use case. Uh, I don't have that. Um, oh, it might have hiccuped when stuff moved. Yeah, sorry, I just took that one out. Okay. Um, CSAC recommends the Bureau document the data governance principles associated with SPF, such as tiered access. Uh, number 10, CSAC recommends that the Bureau provide a detailed explanation of their process for determining the privacy loss budget for the IRS use case. 11, CSAC recommends that the Bureau evaluate cryptographic approaches to improve the accuracy of the statistics computed in the IRS application and other cross-silo settings. And number 12, CSAC recommends the Bureau implement data governance principles such as accessibility and transparency by adding a short summary of data provenance and processing methods to each census data product. So comment there, um, I think it might be each Bureau data product as opposed to... For example, outlining the data sources for each variable and the frequency of use of administrative and modeled records and responses. So, I think Can that we add yeah. Reference to that. Um, okay. Ed, sorry. So I'm wondering, can in addition to those other things, uh, data sources for each variable, time reference and frequency of, I just, I have this bug about time reference. Yeah. Okay. It seems like a friendly amendment. Anybody? Can, can you stick that in there, Robert? Okay. So, it, yeah, that sounds great. It was um, Kunal who started writing, and then we were conferring on the other side about it. It was just the fact that a lot of times these data blending or integration things, they don't say where anything comes from, right? And oh, yeah. and it would just be nice if they actually were upholding the data conference principles that they're saying that they're going to shoot for, right, by starting with. Yeah. Or they tell you the item allocation rates, but not the allocation method in a way that's easy to figure out. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. and, and thinking about, like, the different summaries that you might want to think about, which I don't know if you want to add in there about, because we talked about how some data users are sophisticated enough to understand maybe, like, some of the documentation, but not all of it, and how, anyways, we can go on on this topic forever, I think. <laughs> okay. So that's been amended to say, for example, outlining the data sources for each variable, time reference, and the frequency of use of administrative and modeled records and responses. Is that okay? All right. All right, so we're done with that section. Address frame maintenance. Um, CSEC strongly recommends the Bureau. Um, so my preference is not to say strongly because I don't think it does anything. Um, you know, it's, it's a, just a recommendation. They're going to go through recommendation by recommendation. As soon as we say CSAC recommends, they have to respond to it. If it's a strong recommendation, it should be strongly motivated by whatever's around it. And um, so I would argue against saying strongly because th that suggests that we have a hierarchy of recommendations. There's some weak recommendations. <laughs> we can ignore the rest. <laughs> yeah. Casually. CSAC barely recommends. Yeah. <laughs> Here's was the question that I had on that. Children, um, and it got it's disappeared. I don't know, but I think that's really important that um, I recommend targeted field activities and hard to count addresses and housing. I would add children at the end. Um, okay. I think low income. Uh, oh, I know. I would have um, addresses and populations. Right now, it's yeah. Mm -hmm. In the paragraph above, it does. Oh, thanks for it. There, there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's the the thing, and and I think it's what in is in three different public comments um, from at least two sources um, that they they oppose, and they suggest that CSAC should oppose, and I, I think ultimately we have, or, or certainly I do. Uh, oppose the use of only in office. So rather than saying strongly recommends or recommend, should we say CSAC opposes the um, uh, elimination of uh, in-field address canvassing 
in its entirety and recommends blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And another way to do that would be um, CSAC recommends the Bureau to continue targeted field activities, blah, blah, blah. CSAC opposes any blah, blah, blah that would eliminate, would, that would completely eliminate in field. Okay. To, to add it into the recommendation, the would that work? Mm -hmm. The same one, just. Um, no. I think I just said what it's you your said, Ron, and flipped I, it I over. I already <laughs> messed with it too much. <laughs> Does that make Ron, sense? Would, would it make sense to say that the the, the field operations um, should be designed to evaluate the in-office operations so that they could understand where, the, like, like to to optimize, like, like essentially, so because there's no feedback loop, like, like there's no ground truth, <laughs> right? So they don't know the, if these methods that they're developing, like, they don't know. Uh, how good or bad they are in different types of settings. So is one is one way to rather than saying you should you know spend six hundred million dollars and do address canvassing everywhere. I'm wondering if there's a way to say it to, yeah. to sample it sort of. Or and, and you know they yeah. have done that in past censuses, um, and they found unfortunately that as many mistakes occur in the field as there are from the in office. So there's there's always this strum and drum between the two of them. Um, I'm not opposed to putting that in there. Does everybody think that's a good idea? We could say questions eliminating. I would say questions completely eliminating. Yeah, completely. I don't think we're no, you should eliminate some, or yeah. actually most, right? Uh, mm We defined Luca. Sorry, sorry, Chris. I was. Okay. An acronym. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, CSAC recommends that the Bureau reconsider the interpretation of LUCA and CQR declines and perform additional analyses on the LUCA and CQR to assess whether the patterns of decline are from inaccuracy in the addresses and the count or from limited resources, e.g., time, people, technical expertise, software funding, to update addresses for submission or count challenges. So just add in um, maybe an introductory paragraph saying how they had previously. 
Okay. Is that the report? Can't. Is, is that the report that we were told was private? Yes, that we couldn't distribute. But Jay said I could talk about it. <laughs> Should I not mention it? I don't know. It's a question for Shauna. Can we mention this report and the findings? What? <laughs> so, Shauna, we received a draft report. We were told, please do not circulate, but we can talk about the content of that report, can't we? Or Yeah, I think they just didn't want, oh, hey, here's an interesting report. Let's distribute it to our mailing list. Um, but the, the content was just background on the presentation. So we're, and we're not going into any level of detail that's going to cause problems, I don't think. Our, so we could mention it basically in the recommendation. Yep. Maybe we could but, say based on background information provided yeah. or something like that that doesn't, doesn't like say that there's a report you can't read. Yeah. Uh, 12.55. Okay. So we're good. 12.55? Yeah. 1.55. Yeah. I was doing the same thing. I was doing the same thing because my father's yeah, on okay. the okay. 12.55 Central, that's what you mean. Yeah. So, <laughs> 1.55. All right. Um, so, sorry. Okay, so, so Gwen's adding an introductory sentence for that recommendation. Um, so can we go on to 15? Yes. CSAC recommends beginning LUCA earlier in the decade and enhancing outreach activities to engage tribes and smaller governments. This includes providing LUCA participants with tools, including but not limited to address standardizers and geocoders that output information in a format readily compatible with Census Bureau requirements that will enable any new addresses to be added more readily to the master address file, MAF. Are we taking out census and census I, I assume that Claire would just go through and do that for me because I count on her. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, my bad. Um, there was a public comment uh, that came in that's related to this um, that was saying that the Census Bureau should locate um, some of its staff members in um, states and localities to assist in the LUCA process and in updating the addresses. I think it's something that's worth while well, thinking about adding in here. I, I It could be added to, to this um, response or we could do a separate one uh, if you all agree what are your thoughts on this could we say something like with tools um, or technical expertise from or something like that without the the public comment was basically saying put people in the field right put a person there but yeah, yeah I was trying to think of a way to say, um, yeah, the technical expertise would be a person, <laughs> but that, yeah. that's not clear, I agree. Right, but I, the, the, I think the sentence is local elected officials may not have sufficient knowledge uh, and, and partnership with CBOs in identifying unique addresses, and so that would be one way to put it in. Sorry, Barbara, where were you just uh, then? Oh. I was just reading from Allison's uh, oh, okay. comment. Um. Oh, 
Well, if anyone wants to work on that 15, or um, then we could return to it. Uh, I don't know if there's a general sentiment or not. Well, okay, one easy one is that the um, this includes providing the participants with tools, including but not limited, blah, 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 and expertise that will enable any new addresses to be blah, blah, blah. So we just add expertise as the point was made. That's usually a person. Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. Well, I'm <laughs> I said in technical <laughs> expertise. Okay. And so what happened? I don't know. <laughs> I'm already forgotten. <laughs> we just saw the gavel pass. <laughs> yeah. I guess, the, I, guess the, I guess the question on that, in, in reference to what Allison was saying, was um, that expertise should be provided locally. Right. Do you want me to add local expertise? Well, but local expertise means, yeah. Well, I think expertise provided locally. I think the way Ron said it is yeah. exactly right. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, 16. CSAC recommends that future iterations of the address count listing file include tallies that represent both the decennial census and ACS filters for each block to include the total number of housing units, basic street addresses, and group quarters facilities to assist local government's understanding of changes to their address counts in support of the local LUCA program. Hmm. Okay. CSAC. Oh, yeah. Please. So the decennial census isn't normally lowercase unless you're referring to a specific decennial? Okay. okay. It's uppercase at the say, 2020 census. Okay. Thank you. CSAC recommends employing the LUCA program to identify hard-to-count areas, hidden units, and commercial addresses. CSAC recommends compiling the number of non-city style street addresses, John Chica, oh, addresses by geography and comparing those results to MAF tabulations to target locations for infield address updates where major discrepancies occur. So John, your little bubble shows up right where I'm reading. <laughs> CSAC recommends oh, publishing. Oh, yeah. Could we yeah. say hidden housing units, just to be more clear? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Gwen. Um, okay, so 19. CSAC recommends publishing quality metrics and assessments, precision and recall, for identifying housing in different types of environment, e.g. urban, rural, or heavily forested areas, that respond to geospatial imagery differently. And number 20, CSAC recommends expanding partnerships with tribal nations to better develop methodologies to identify addresses in tribal lands beyond reliance on the four tribal specialists for all 574 federally recognized tribal nations, all the tribal areas, and the state tribes. This is particularly important for building partnerships across these politically diverse nations with different regulations surrounding types of data collection, e.g. imagery of villages, and different forms of housing units, e.g. pueblos. You go, girl. <laughs> Okay, and um, <laughs> 21, CSAC recommends revisiting the drone footage obtained from unknown sources on YouTube used to identify housing units in Alaska. That's funny. <laughs> That's very tepid, I think. Tepid? Yeah, it's revisiting, meaning like, like examining closely, like... The mic. The mic. Yeah, use... Maybe you're eating I think we can make it slightly stronger, like uh, evaluate the credibility of or the utility of the drone footage, and rel and yeah, and, and oh, just the maybe universal the representativeness. Like we don't know what it represents exactly. Like so, I would maybe representativeness is what we're interested in here. Did did we hear about this? Was this in the? I, I don't remember it in the um, presentation. presentation. Yeah, I didn't either. Okay. I think this might be one we should. Yeah, yeah because well, that. Well, I don't, know. I don't know. It's like they are they. Maybe we can do we. Maybe we don't have to put in a recommendation. They, uh, but I don't know. I, I don't know. As alternative sources used to identify housing units in. E.g. 
I guess it's okay. It's, it's not weird. that they're using drones. As uh, Gwen was saying, they're using YouTube footage, other people's YouTube footage dr that's based on drones. So they don't right. know who the YouTubers are, you know. Yeah. Oh. But it's a draft report that they shared right. in confidence. And I don't know if it does a lot to, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you, Seth. I think there's a sentiment that we delete. Any objections to get rid of it? I don't mind. I'll try to make it the case. Oh, sorry. Sorry, no, you were speaking first. I was going to say, I don't mind just making it more generic, just not say drones, but just reevaluate or okay. evaluate the credibility of all sources that they use. I was going to say, either we make it more general or we can request like additional information because I think we're. Is it, would it go up to like a future meeting discussion or another one-way briefing that way we don't lose it? Because I think it is still important. So this is drone technology is taken off everywhere, right? And over the next few years, it's going to be ubiquitous more than it is already. And um, I didn't, I read the comment, the, the recommendation, but I don't know why it's there. But it inspires me to think that maybe uh, they could crowdsource drone footage in the future to do some canvassing of some kind. With I mean, local, I. With like locally informed crowdsourcing. It, Sorry, I'm trying to it would have to be piloted. It would have to be evaluated. They would have to do the research now whether it's even feasible in the next decade. So maybe that's the recommendation. And that could also be a suggestion for a future topic. So generally. Um, just move that up to intro about um, different crowdsource things, including. But, but I don't actually even recall them mentioning the, this. It so I'm just. It's only in the I'm reacting to that sentence. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, so the proposal would be: let's delete this and think about whether we want to include it as a recommendation for a future agenda topic, of in sort of broader sense, not YouTube in Alaska. But yeah. does that work? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So future presentations at CSAC meetings? Yeah, and that can actually go up top, so we can work on that later. I, I also think Mario Mario's broader point was that if, you know, not doing Luca, if there, there are these cost avoidance strategies, you know, uh, around not putting sort of, you know, feet on the ground in places to do address canvassing, there are other alternatives yeah. <laughs> to doing that, like, like these things. And so I think, I, I don't know. And would that all fit in one recommendation for a future topic that says consider these alternative data sources, any, or would it not really? I mean, would that capture it, or I won't be here, so I don't care. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, we can ask for. Yeah, we can ask for innovative approaches to. Uh, oh yeah, I'm just trying to figure out a way to make that general. Um, but you're working on it, looks like, Gwen. So I'll let you be. No, well, if you have ideas, I'm open. Oh, I'm not there. <laughs> okay. So that finishes up um, the section, and we're on to the Frames Program update. Can I ask one question? I'm not sure where it goes, but it's about the multi family dwelling units as opposed to single family dwelling units. Um, is that a master list? Concern? Chris, could you say it again? I didn't quite understand you. Um, yeah, it can, it's something that comes up in the coalition for human needs um, about the measurement of household numbers in multiple, multiple dwelling units, like apartment buildings. And that, that as a potential explanation for the undercount of children and others. This, it's kind of 19, maybe it could be added on to that, you know, for example, e.g., uh, or hyperly forest areas, or uh, multi-unit residences. Yeah, it's kind of addressed a little bit in 16 as well. That's what the BSA, the basic street address is. If you look at the tallies of basic street addresses versus total units, you get a sense of where the apartments are. Like to be more explicit than basic street addresses. 
Right, no, I, I get you. I'm just was saying it, it was also touched. Would it be useful to try to spell that out in 16 a little more explicitly? Would that work or? I'd just say including apartment buildings. In 17? Uh, that could be in 16. I don't have a, a, a preference. I just want to make sure we get it in somewhere because that is one of the potential sources of the other cops. Yeah, I think a, uh, I think seventeen would be a great place to put it. Yeah, I you guys good. agree? Yep. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Um, okay, so the, we're done with that section. On to frames. So CSAC recommends that the bureau develop and share a roadmap of its plans to enhance frames and for how the value added by the frames program will be measured and evaluated. Is frames all caps? Is that how? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> and actually it should be all caps. Yeah. Okay. Um, 22, CSAC recommends that the Bureau prepare a working paper that describes improvements over the past decade in the PVS system. Oh, um, no, that's okay. It's defined right above. Per, it's the person. Yeah. And, and that's how they abbreviate it? There's no I? There's no I. All right. And up and an updated report on pick rates based on the ACS and also other data sources. CSAC recommends that the Bureau arrange to obtain from the SSA parental addresses from the birth certificates in addition to parental names and create the CHCK based... <laughs> Do they pronounce that somehow? The I call it chick. <laughs> the chick based on assigning picks using both names and addresses. Improving links between children and their parents will improve the demographic frame's coverage of young children, a group often undercounted. Um, any comments? Okay. CSAC recommends that the Bureau assess the strengths and weaknesses of household reconstruction by grouped MAF ID through comparisons of the reconstructed households with decennial census data, as well as selected national surveys such as the ACS. 25, the quality of the links among the geospatial demographic jobs and business frames will depend on the degree to which the time periods mesh. For this reason, CSAC recommends that the temporal references of the frames be carefully documented. Yeah, it's the frames program, all caps. Oh, okay. um, but it, is this the temporal of these? No, these are the name and frames. Yeah. These are the specific frames, so yeah. then it probably shouldn't be capitalized at all. <laughs> The dictionary just for recommends that links between the geospatial demographic jobs and business frames be examined, compared, and assessed to improve the information included in individual frames and also to understand inclusion and exclusion of persons from the linked frames. CSAC recommends removing the requirement that a person must have a MAF ID to be included in the demographic frame. CSAC recommends that MAF IDs be included in the demographic frame. Are you capitalizing? Actually, this they don't. Not? They clarified that the, you don't have to have a MAF ID to be in the frame, because that was the whole point of imputing tract. It's for cases, if you have a MAF ID, you know the tract. Well, there no. was a separate presentation. That was a separate presentation. We're pretty sure that they're requiring a MAP ID in the demographic frame. Yeah, but you, you're correct. But the continuous. That, that was in the project. continuous one. Took an extract of that frame and had records without MAP IDs. No, they took an extract of lots of different sources. This is for the continuous. This is a separate presentation. Um, This light goes off. Um, but it was pulling an extract of those I, data. The, the, the records without the MAF ID were not the ads. The ads were kind of a weird little little group. I don't know in that case. That, I don't know that they, that was the information that they were dealing with was from the demographic frame. I think it was from, uh, we could check back, but I don't think they were for that the, I don't think 
I think there were other sources of information other than the demographic frame. Well, there's stuff they added to the extract. Does this keep going off? <laughs> no, it's on. It's, you have it on. Goes, yeah, the yeah. light goes on. I'm, I'm really pretty sure that the demographic frame is limited to well, we pick and amp map ideas. Little... I, I did. In the presentation, I asked, and they said that's just, I said, why did you, why do you have the requirement that an, uh, an individual needs to have a map to be included in the frame? And they said, well, just that's just because that's how we did it. Yeah. <laughs> I frankly don't believe every person knows exactly the right okay. answer to that who's talking to us. But maybe we can uh, make sure that's not happening. Well, I guess if this doesn't hurt if they say, well, it already, the response can be, we don't have that requirement. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. We could hedge and say, recommends removing any requirement that a person must have a MAF ID because then if one exists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. And is the, is, is the paragraph above too snarky? <laughs> so the question is, uh, individuals do not need an identifiable residential address to exist in the real world. But under the current design of the demographic frame, people must have an address. It's a little snarky. I feel the snark. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> Lance Walker. Um, okay, <laughs> yes. CSAC recommends that MAF IDs be included in the demographic frame as supplementary information associated with a person. Pick, for example, as a timestamped list, e.g., MAF ID date one, MAF ID date two. sense to everybody um, if everyone's okay with that I just had a follow-up question maybe I missed it um, folks were talking before about um, non-picked records still being in the person frame did you all decide that um, that wasn't a required recommendation so um then they need, yeah, basically we decided not to include that. It's hard to know how they would be identified and deduplicated. Um, I, I think it's covered in the request for a much deeper and updated dive on, on the pick assignments themselves. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to double check. No, I'm glad you did. Is that a one-way briefing topic, pick assignments? I thought it was because we talked. PBS about validation system should be a presentation. Yeah, I um, feel like that's a CSAC presentation. I want to be able to ask questions and yeah. drill down. I thought on we had that. something on that because we, we talked about it. That, that updates. You meant you mentioned a report or something and said we should have a more current. Yeah, so that's that's in that here as be, a recommendation. Yeah. But the question is, do we want to ask for a particular presentation on that? On twenty eight. There's a separate record for every different ID, every different MAF ID. That's our understanding. So it's pick MAF ID, pick MAF ID, pick MAF ID, pick MAF ID. Pick yeah. MAF ID. And so Seth's recommendation here? is that it, it be a wide sort of format. So pick and then MAF ID, MAF ID, MAF ID. But the problem with that is that they put a probability on each of these records. Oh, I the think records sum to one. That is true in the continuous count study where they're talking about using administrative records, but that's separate from the demographic frame. Yes. So every, you, you're correct. It's just that they, they gave us two presentations. One was on yeah, using administrative right. records for the continuous count, and one was about the but demographic I thought they, frame. They, they, but they said the they got their probabilities. They got probabilities from the frame, that they were these special uh, probabilities. I don't think think that's the No, that case. wasn't the case. They developed the probabilities in the con they, in the continuous count study. Yeah. Well, they have, but he, okay, they, I, I'm sure they have other probabilities that come from. I, I don't know. I haven't seen any presentation that there's a probability yeah, on any a record in the frame, although. A different description of those probabilities? I, I think it's a great recommendation that every record on the frame should have a probability of success, but I don't believe yeah. there's one there now. At least from what we've heard. All right. 
Or should we be vague? Or, well, whatever. <laughs> Uh, is there any anything to add or on 28 are we okay as is or okay I'm moving 29 CSAC recommends that the Bureau develop and share a plan for when and how products from and evaluations of the frames program will be made available to users including those participants in FSRDCs it Okay, moving to um, continuous count. CSAC recommends that the Bureau link, um, link the business framing group quarters, conduct research to determine which administrative record sources provide the greatest accuracy, provide information to CSAC on the number of records added to the frames extract by each administrative record source. So multi-part recommendation. CSAC recommends. Uh, sorry, quick question. Yeah. Business frame RB and F capital. I guess they were in the last section. Oh, we're capitalizing individual frame because it's a title, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. Thanks, Kanal. Exactly. <laughs> Not me. Um, okay. CSAC recommends that the continuous count study be employed to aid in understanding of state differences between the 2020 decennial and 2020 PES, and that the Bureau publish the results and explore the implementation of subsequent iterations of the continuous count study to enhance the 2030 PES results. Okay. 32. Um, on the subject of communication, CSAC recommends that the Bureau provide a report to CSAC on the planned use of the 2020 decennial census results in future iterations of this research, when these results will be available, and if they will be included in the 2030 planning database. So, so that one probably doesn't need a bullet because it's just the one. Okay, 33. Um, a multi-part one that I don't want to read the whole thing because I want to save my voice. <laughs> um, but explore production of confidence intervals, develop quality measures, explore the creation of household-based models, assess the impact of respondent information as proxy responses. Any? I'm giving you the skunk eye. <laughs> I am. 34. With respect to enhancing data sources, CSAC recommends that the Bureau Again, multi-part, update the MAF to link non-city style address information, determine the impact of adding other surveys, and collect additional data from state or local sources, and provide incentives. Okay. And 35, another multi-part. CSAC um, recommends the Bureau expand and update its analyses of the adjusted measures for the continuous count including but not limited to the following and update the committee on the findings. Um, so track level statistics compared to estimates produced by state partners and FSCPE and produce estimates for municipalities and compare those to the Bureau's sub-county population estimates. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But I'm supposed to be talking, so. All right. <laughs> okay, so any um, any comments on that one? <laughs> All right. Okay, on to sip seamless. Um, Scroll. Yeah. All right. Yeah, John. Yay, John. <laughs> okay. Um, 36. CSAC recommends that the Bureau evaluate the comparative advantages of starting each panel in January versus February. One advantage of starting the panel in February is making January rather than December the common month for all six rotation groups in odd-numbered waves consistent with most SIP panels under the original design. 
The Bureau, in its presentation, provided a rationale for having December as the common month in those waves. Why, why do we want that last sentence? We recognize that there was some specific rationale for that. That's why we were asking for an evaluation. So we changed the first sentence to be an evaluation, and then we're mm -hmm. giving reason for having the two evaluated. Okay. Maybe it goes like an intro paragraph to the comment. If you move that sentence up. Mario, are you saying to having that last sentence in the preamble instead right. of in the recommendation? Exactly. Okay. I think that makes sense. Um, so we'll work our magic. Okay. Thank you. Um, is that me? That's my alarm that says time is passing. <laughs> getting there. Okay. Um, 37, is that where we are? Yeah. CSAC recommends that the Bureau explore whether the frames, data, and administrative records, so frames all caps, yeah. and administrative records can provide housing unit level or at least small area level covariates that can be incorporated into unit non-response adjustments. CSAC recommends that the Bureau incorporate administrative records to the extent possible in its expanded use of model-based imputation in the SIP. CSAC recommends that the Bureau's decisions on reordering sections and questions incorporate findings from cognitive testing and field tests. CSAC recommends, as an alternative to comparing the two designs for the same calendar year, that the Bureau consider two complementary approaches and report back to CSAC. First, the Bureau could compare 2027 data collected under the current design and 2028 data collected under the new design to a third source for validation, e.g. administrative data for program participation and income. Second, the Bureau could directly compare estimates across the two years for other characteristics that can be presumed or ideally demonstrated from other sources to have minimal change between 2027 and 2028. Okay. Um, okay, 41. CSAC recommends that the Bureau explore the use of business register data matched to SIP respondents as a replacement for information collected from the respondents and report back to CSAC possibly in a one-way briefing, on its findings regarding the quality of the synthetic estimates that would replace survey responses on the SIP public use files. Actually, I mean, we're, that's, that's their idea, not ours. <laughs> so maybe um, make this just focus on reporting back. Um, Could it just be a, um, a one-way briefing or a, a future agenda topic? Yeah, we're basically, we're, we're assenting to their plan to Okay. To explore business data. So maybe I'm asking, should we cut it as a recommendation, just move it up to the intro and say we want to hear back about this? Or is there anything? Well, they, they specifically asked us what we thought. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> it's We're weird because it's. That is like an implicit. Yeah. Go ahead and do it. Tell us what you find out. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, or it's a punt. Um, that's how it feels to me. Well, how does it feel like a punt? Sorry. Well, they yeah, ask we, us we specifically could... for, for what we have to say on this, and then we say, oh, no, we just want you to do another presentation on it. It, it doesn't feel responsive to me. Yeah, when if we the... think it's fine, we should say so. Yeah. If we think we need more information, then... So the question was, should we explore business register data matched to SIP responses? I, I just don't know that question. You know, we agree with their plan, but that's not a recommendation. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but we do, um, we said that in a previous paragraph, okay? So maybe we just make this... Um, recommends that the Bureau report back to CSAC on the findings quality of this. 
And then we get around the other issue. By the way, in the, in the private conversation afterwards, uh, J J uh, Jason said that uh, Neil just threw in synthetic. It, it's not an official plan. You know, <laughs> they have to do something to the data. And so. So is somebody editing this? Uh, I can do that. So is everything being cut out until the report back? Uh, at that point, it should just be at the top. And then keep the paragraph where you address. I don't know. I, I mean, the context is really important here. I think yeah. it, it fits better in this section than up top. Yeah, so the, the introductory paragraph there is critical that says we, um, we support investigation of the approach, but we need to see evidence that it's going to work. So that's their, um, and which is what it says. So um, And is it okay as cut? Or I think it looks good. Short or punchier. Uh, CSAC recommends that the Bureau explore the proposed data integration approach to program participation and report back to CSAC on its findings. CSAC recommends that the Bureau focus on health insurance coverage dynamics, program participation rates based on sufficient information to simulate eligibility, and household and family composition dynamics. CSAC recommends that the Bureau expand the brief annual report on wealth to include comparative analyses across subpopulations based on the extensive supplemental tables. CSAC recommends that the Bureau expand its SIP products to include uh, reports on the topics listed as value adds above, expanded reports on topics covered in previous reports, including income sources of older households, benefits by veterans, number, timing, duration of marriages, blah, 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 reports on new topics. Uh, my note here on the side could be part of the text because I think they, this is a, apparently um, the well being measures are really in danger of being cut. So, um, that, and that's a really important addition. There's not anywhere else in, except in the full survey. Chris, I don't see your note on the side. No. Um, it says, oh, really? It says, let's say I, I have to do it did again. You, did you post it? You, um, when you make a comment. So, okay, uh, I don't know. Hit the comment post. button if you. There it is. SIP notes that data on the well being of adults and children are part of the goals. It's not a recommendation, but a paragraph um, before the recommendation 45. So, in a in a quick read, yeah, does it make sense to stick it right before 45 and add well-being to 45? Or um, um, I don't. Yes. I, I, yes, it should. Oh, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, we can't say SIP notes. We can say. Oh, yeah. do, do we say? Uh, I didn't want to say Chris notes. C sec. I mean, he said it in his talk, so I thought it was it's a pair of, Those are a quote from uh, Jason's talks. Oh yeah, Gwen asks if we could just delete the first sentence because. The next one says CSAC notes that. Um, okay. With our. Okay. 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 Um, and 46, CSAC recommends that the Bureau release portions of its Python code that are likely to benefit SIP users. 
one last thing on 45. It's got three parts. All the other multi-part ones we had were bullets and not numbered. I didn't know how to do bullets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Claire. Um, all right. And then 47 was the Python code. No. All right. So we're moving on to statistical grids. 47, CSAC recommends the GRIDS initiative collaborate with the SPF initiative and report back to the CSAC, no, <laughs> on the potential for delivering statistical products for novel, geographically specific areas beyond existing bureau geographies, e.g. school districts or areas impacted or likely impacted by hazards, such as coastal communities or populations within watersheds. CSAC recommends that the Bureau, yay, work closely with the disclosure avoidance team in order to determine data structures that may be needed to inform aspects of gridded output, such as resolution, and the production of an uninhabited grid. Uh, CSAC recommends that the Bureau, for its U.S. graded data products, produce variable resolution data products. If using... Um, can we say that without repeating data products? Um, we say recommends that the Bureau produce variable resolution data products for the U.S.? Or is that? Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> if using a, thank you, if using a latitude longitudinal grid, these grids should be high resolution in urban areas, somewhat less fine in areas in the urban periphery, and fairly coarse, perhaps coarser than one kilometer, where the population is sparse. If the Bureau aims to produce a one kilometer grid, um, as an initial data product, CSAC recommends also producing a grid of around 250 meters for urban areas. Yeah, it could be You want to say of at least 250 meters? Yeah. No more than? Um, yeah, no more than? <laughs> Not at least. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, sorry. No, we discussed this. Sorry, I came over and we changed it. Um, so it's no more than or no yeah, coarser than? than? Okay. CSAC yeah. recommends that the Bureau produce a grid of land or surface, including water area, in each grid cell. Okay. Um, CSAC recommends that the Bureau experiment with the use of geohashing or another modern method to translate latitude and longitude into spatially flexible data products. CSAC recommends, can I just comment, it seemed like in the discussion the, um, they seemed to think that geohashing precluded a one kilometer grid, which it certainly doesn't. They, they seem to think it precluded what? A one kilometer grid, which it certainly doesn't. Yeah, no, of course not. Yeah, yeah but I thought they thought that it did. So maybe I had that impression. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, this is a slightly, this is a, I don't mean to be off topic here. I, I made some suggestions at the very top, but we had a, this meeting, we had two presenters who were very new to the presentation style. And I think like, had we had a one-way briefing on this topic at, for like a 40-minute presentation by them, we would have learned so much more. It would have let us know how to make comments better to them. I don't know that that was as true for the prior, uh, for yesterday's presenter who was subbing for Deirdre, right? So, um, because, but I think that there's just some, something was lost in a little bit of that, but the, I mean, so this is a general comment. We can, revi we can revise the specific comment to be, I mean, there must be other things other than geohashing, but geohashing is remarkably simple. They were really, you had to say that like a half dozen times in the after conversation, Seth. You know, you kept on saying, no, no, it's, it's not computationally demanding. No, no, you can do it with any, you know, lat long coordinates that you have. No, no, you, it's not like a lot of data processing and and, and so on. So I, it let, I, I'll go to the comment and try to, let's, let's fix this comment, but it's a more general um, comment that sometimes like there's more education that has to happen and that takes like repeated exposures, um, so to speak. Uh, you know, right, like redundancy is sometimes useful. Um, okay, so that's comment. Um, is that 51 that we're in, Jay? 51, yeah, it's geohashing. Okay, so uh, I will, let's see, let's say CSAC recommends a bureau experiment with use of geohashing. Um, uh, 
you had the impression that they thought one kilometer couldn't be done. Right? It, 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 they seem to think, well, I could be completely wrong, but I just had the impression they're like, well, we wanted to start off with a one kilometer grid because that would be, you know, a useful way to get started and impress people by the utility. But you could start off with geohashing and get yeah, out of the I, one I think, I think grid. their perspective was it's sort of non objectionable on any grounds and they uh, can get it out the door. Okay. And then yeah, which, refine. And then refine. Well, there, there is some comment. I, there's later down, there's a thing go ahead. If you're going to do it, one of these grids, go ahead and think about a one kilometer grid, but you're also going to have to do a higher resolution one for the urban areas. Maybe that was up top. Maybe that's the one we just went through. But um, yeah, okay. I've, um, I, I will make a comment. They ex See, this is where the word strongly would be nice, but I know you think it's lost. Like, I, we do strongly recommend that they don't feel they have to rely on this, like, they're in just sort of inheriting an old approach, and I think there's no need for them to do that. How about we just say, we emphasize this would not preclude up with it. That's good. Yeah. All right, so... <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, 52. Okay. CSAC recommends that the Bureau explore the attribution of a Z-coordinate in its grid system to represent altitudes or structure heights. This addition is important for the integration and use of data for and by other agencies, such as the USDA, Forestry Service. It's the Forest Service. Um, uh, is it Forest Service? Yep. Okay. And it's the USDA Forest Service. Uh -huh. Are these intended to be two different things? Uh, Ron wrote it. Ron. It could be Noah. You can f throw in Noah. Yeah, put it over in Forestry Service. It's Forestry. Yeah, Forest Service. Yeah, U.S. Forest Service is inside the USDA, but we could just say Noah. Noah, FEMA. We like the acronyms. Okay. Yeah, let's just like acronym them. Out. Furthermore, this approach provides the capability for the bureau to project 3D images of characteristics such as housing and population density. Yeah. Fifty-three. Thank you for the thank. Ron, that was Ron's con, Ron contribution. Thank you for that. CSAC recommends that the bureau allow for users to define the geographic specificity, extent, and resolution of grids, depending on a set of requirements about the underlying data, i.e., meeting certain thresholds. Testing would have to be done to compare top-down data products, such as those on the bureau's geographic spine of nested regions, with user-generated gridded products. CSAC recommends that the Bureau compare population estimation from its new U.S. gridded products with international grid statistical products for the U.S., not only with respect to the predictions themselves, but also contrast inputs, methodologies, and calibration techniques. Oh, ground truthing and improving the global data products. And, yeah, um, well, also, like, it, to, it helps to show... Okay, like, hmm, mm, yeah, I'm thinking about this because, well, yeah. Like, the, the main purpose is they just said there's their predictions and here's ours and ours are better, but I want to know why why they're different, or so I'd like them to say they use these inputs and we use those inputs. It just needs to be contrasted, not just here's one prediction, here's another prediction. So I, I don't know if I'm capturing that, but that's what the contrast inputs. I mean, there are two things. They showed us this with the global data products, which they all, all of those, there's no ground truthing for any of those. The global data products are all, like, just compare them all, and, you know, the visual, the ones that are most visually precise tend to win, even if they're the most, they're the ones with a 90% um, explainable variance, because they throw every endogenous variable possible in to the model. That's the nature of it. They're just trying to get people allocated so then it means if you care about like using these data with like uh, proximity to water you can't really because they put people close to water it's endogenous like they've chosen to put people near water because we have some n notion probably true that people live near water right so but then you can't use it to estimate that but the other thing here and the, this this point I was instead of making that point which has been made over many times in addition I wanted to make the point that the US global products which will be bottom up from the input microdata will give us will let us know how we're doing that is a form of like validation data for global data grids so and that's really important that's a contribution to the 
the production of these global data sets. So I can make yep. that clear here if we think that's I, reasonable. Would that be helpful? Yeah. Okay. I've got a really small question. Is it population estimation or population estimates? Estimates. Thanks. Well, wait a minute. I have a concern about that because there is a population estimates program in the Census Bureau. I don't want to confuse this with that program and the population estimates they create. So is there another way we can say that? Spatial population estimates. Or estimated. population distributions? Estimates of, po of the spatial distribution of population. It's really the spatial piece that they're getting yeah. right. We know at the top level they're all right because they all add up to the constraints imposed on the model, which is, can't be greater than the established total that's given by national authorities. So it will always match. So spatial is the key term. Makes sense. Okay. But I'm not writing. So is anybody changing? Is somebody I'm writing, but I've got gridded in the sentence three, three times. times. Okay, hold on. Um, so do you want to put spatial? Spatial? spatial. Yeah, sure. Yes, yes. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, so... 55, CSAC recommends that the Bureau produce guidelines for use of gridded data products, both those constructed for the U.S. and other countries. This could include example programs, R, Python, for users on examples of how to summarize gridded data into tabular data or use with other types of data, e.g. how to calculate population or housing density and attach that information to user-supplied survey of interest. What does that mean, a user-supplied survey of interest? It, it's just like it, data integration. It's a data, like, the people will want to use these data and integrate them with other data sets, typically. That's often how these data are used. So okay. they should give examples of how to do it. So you come along, you have some information, you want to attach a contextual variable. These data, this type of data gets added as contextual variables frequently. User supply data is fine. Okay. It's just like it, survey is just a type, that, but yeah, that's fine. Okay. That was just being more specific. Um, CSAC recommends the Bureau summarize and report back to CSAC on themes and temporal specifications that cannot easily be met by restricted data for the new U.S. gridded data products. Maybe restricted. Um, yeah, that's okay. I don't think temporal specifications need to be hyphenated, but um, but it no problem, right? And 57, CSAC recommends that the Bureau include Puerto Rico as a test case for its new gridded products, producing perhaps prototype earlier grids and for other locations, and then placing those grids into the hands of FEMA and municipality authorities in Puerto Rico for feedback and potential use in planning before the next storm arrives. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> you take out the I wrote it, yeah, so take it out. Yeah. Yeah, sure, prototype grids. Yep, that's good. Provide those... Placing those grids, providing those grids to. Yeah, I know. I just like hands off. This is why I was knitting. And Gwen providing those grids to. Getting those grids to FEMA, or then, or providing. Yeah, providing. Providing. I got it. I got it. Okay. Many. All right. Can we jump back up to the very beginning one more time? So, um, one-way briefings. Um, we definitely had the local differential privacy and the accompanying R package. Um, are there other one-way briefings that we had? Okay. Do we still want a one-way briefing on the U.S. gridded data products? Uh, I think they're really not very far along yeah. in this, so I would say yes. And just I, I stuck in the pa in the paragraph beforehand uh, while half listening, so it's probably ungrammatical, but the. Um, 
the I think that and if Tommy is listening, I think that it's a good thing for the like new presenters to sort of know. I think they were disappointed that we couldn't like they said, well, we can we talk to you more about this stuff? Uh -huh. And the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's a, a flat no. Like we can you can give us a presentation. So if they give us a presentation in advance, then we can make our comments better and the and that's more of a dialogue and the process is a little lost or you know, if it's really something that's going to be ongoing and they need more infusion, they need, like, a, a working group. But that's a bigger process and not something that we would recommend uh, out, outright necessarily. Okay. Yeah, that looks like a friendly amendment to me. Oh, for the one-way briefing? Yeah, like, um, Yeah, this, this doesn't give a temporal scale, but um, general principle, if there's going to be, on, if this topic's going to come up again, and we know there's a bunch of technical content, and it's going to be, then try to figure out a one-way briefing before that presentation. Yeah, that's, that's well said. Yeah. I mean, that can go in here. Yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah, and that's the intent here, and we have to be just a little careful that, um, no one thinks we're trying to circumvent the advisory committee process by having secret meetings, offline meetings. So these are just to inform future discussions. They don't do anything else. Yeah. yeah. I think we're at a point where we've read through all the recommendations. I don't think any were in flux as we went through them, right? We had finalized all of them. So, um, can we revisit the last um, one for the future presentations? Yes. That was my really big wording for them. Okay. So this is under bullets. Um, updates on alternative approaches to data collection and address frame building, e.g. crowdsourcing imagery and quality evaluations. That sounds great to me. And maybe just saying corresponding quality evaluations or... Um, so, um, okay, so we just need to make clean copy here, accept the edits, um, and we're good to go. And with some minutes remaining, not a lot. Yeah, yes. Okay. Thank you. So you Before all done, I wanted to make one comment really brief. Okay. Um, which is to um, have folks consider the possibility of doing these meetings online. I don't know if people are even listening, but um, it's, we are, I mean, we're in an environmental crisis, and I don't think all these meetings need to be done in person, and we ought to suggest to the Bureau that they reconsider. And I just want to introduce that idea. Uh, they're expensive for the Bureau. They interrupt all of our lives. And they're bad for the environment. So that's my hoping, hoping to open a conversation at some point. Hey, Chris. Maybe a compromise is that, like, in the spring we're in person, in the fall we're virtual or something, like, yeah, to rotate something like it. that would be great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially because uh, I was just thinking because we always meet in September and that's that wonderful time of year for all the government agencies to figure out all their deliverables before the FY. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, no, I, I thought that might be a good compromise. But, uh, anyhow, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what even one venue one would use to make such a suggestion. But. Well, 
I think um, if we're going to pursue that, that we ought to sort of have a sense of the room about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I'd certainly understand the reasons for your proposal, Chris. Um, I will say the difference between being in person um, and being uh, distant is, uh, to me, uh, fairly substantial in a meeting like this. Um, but I may be unusual that way or maybe still trying to recover from several years of remote work, uh, trying to do creative stuff by appointment on Zoom. Yeah, I think that's why uh, getting a sense of the room is really important. Yeah, that, I guess that's why I was proposing maybe a compromise because I, I completely agree with the comments you've made just like Barbara has. And then actually it was a conversation yesterday when we were drafting some of the recommendations. We realized it was so much easier and faster to do it because we were in person because even with the remote, like all the technology we have, it. I remember when we first did the recommendations when I first, like I, when I first joined CSAC, it was all virtual and it was really tough because I remember like we would talk and then when sound would get cut off because like the way like technology works you can't have the voices yeah anyways and so it was just so much quicker and I do remember in the fall meeting for the 2023 there was like an like a side conversation we had to ha we got to have with other people and then we're like oh that's now going to be a recommendation because we realized that having those side conversations helped so I, I there's definitely pros and cons for both things and that's why I was proposing maybe we do that hybrid of one versus the other for maybe the spring versus the fall but again I don't know if that's like to your point I don't know how do we recommend that uh, I um I do think that there are some a few disadvantages with the being and just to echo Claire's comment that like you know you can't actually only one person can talk in a zoom space at a time and there is a lot of talking over one and talking you know we're all talking at the same time but hearing each other so that's uh, like a, a useful thing but I would support a uh, once a year in person and once a year remote I think that would probably I too like Barbara like forgot what it's like to have in-person meetings so they're like okay great but like I know like two years from now I'll be like I can't make another in-person meeting maybe even in the fall so I recommend we I, I think as I would favor a, a spring in person and a fall um, remote meeting if the yeah I don't know what others so or I propose that as a like to get the comments on that an alternative proposal is just to make it clear to committee members that they are empowered to make a choice around what they would like to do and to make sure that the meeting is structured in a way that it accommodates those choices. Yeah, I mean, it does not, um, it doesn't address the environmental question of reducing air travel. Well, it does potentially, I mean, it, it, it allows people to make the choice to reduce the, the yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll think of that. Anyhow, I just wanted to bring. I just wanted to bring it up. Um, I think early on the meetings were not as well organized for remote, and the topics were much tougher, really. Um, and this this meeting did go really well. Um, I didn't like being on this particular webinar platform. Teams was much better uh, for me. But anyhow, it's not it's not a tough alternative to do it remotely. I think. Anyhow, I don't, so I don't know what the, what the, if this is something that Jay or you, Barbara, would mention to so Tommy at some point in time, but we really, I'm not sure we have a formal sense of the group as yet. I, I fully appreciate your your sentiment on the environment, and I'm, I'm with you on that, but you know, we get together so infrequently anyway, it's twice a year, and there's a lot of value add that happens in the hallway. Um, and when we're having lunch or dinner with each other, that all these ideas spring up that, quite frankly, don't happen when you're virtual. And, and I've been part of the virtual-only meetings, and there is a certain lack of not only camaraderie, but ideas that get bounced out that you'd never hear otherwise. Um, so I'm kind of in favor of uh, Seth's proposal that, you know, individuals, we have a hybrid model, and if individuals feel they don't want to come for environmental reasons or other that they're allowed or that that's a choice that they make I think that it is the current model you don't have to come in person and 
I would add that I think the side conversations with the Bureau staff are really helpful. And they'll be even better when the Bureau's back in a building because we're limited to a small number of people here from the Bureau now. And uh, when we're at the Bureau, you know, those of us who are there for the first <laughs> of these meetings, uh, there were a lot of Bureau people who come. Yeah. With some of the National Academy Committee meetings that have gone to uh, two virtual and one in person per year, but they're not they're not all laid out the same. So the virtual ones are shorter; they're half a day, and it's more. Here's what we're working through really quickly, and the in person ones a day and a half with the full presentations and panel discussions, and it has more of the interactive component because that's harder to do. So you can do. You know, it's it's not just one, you know, it's not the same meeting virtual uh -huh. as it is. And so recognizing that and setting it up around that, but that limits how many presentations we can have and things like that. So I, I do think if you do a hybrid, which I kind of like, I think it increases overall participation, but it shouldn't be implemented as they're all the same. If you, if you treat them the same, I don't think they play out that way. Well, especially all our one-way briefings that we're asking for, that those could be virtual, right? Oh, they, yeah. oh, they have to be. Oh, they always are? Okay, they always I don't, are. I don't know because I joined during the pandemic and, you know. But, Claire, to this point, um, I, I think it's, um, I wouldn't mind, and to um, John's last point, I wouldn't mind if we actually had, like, real breakout rooms with census staffers, if those could be, meet the formal requirements that they're public. You don't like that idea, Kunal? Oh, you, you look like maybe you don't like it. No, no, I like it. I guess I was just worried yeah. about what you were about, what you were pointing out that may not meet the requirements. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well. I mean, but I really, because like, I, I, I mean, we went over and we're talking with the gritters after they were, and like, I would have been happy to continue talking for like, you know, a good solid hour. So like that, like, and that might be, we'd learn more, they'd learn more. Um, I would have no problem with that whole thing being, you you know, making its way onto YouTube or whatever the public requirement is for that sort of thing. So, and and because we can't expect, I mean, it's the hallway is good, but the hallway is short. You know, we're, we have a task to master to put us back in the room after 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever. So those things are, I mean, I would like, if we're going to be in person, Deepening that would be, I think, in our, um, in every, in like mutually advantageous to all of us. How do you so, separate that from a one way briefing? I mean, essentially, you're talking about a one way briefing at the meeting, right? Well, I, I think with feedback, like with like for feedback that's made and then the learning on that, then the formal recommendations get made. So, can we have Thanks, like a, a period of time? Five, you have 10 minutes. Okay, but if instead of having uh, each one end and the next one begin like within 30 seconds, we can build in a schedule that has a 15 minute transition, and that would that would yeah help yeah. Well, thanks, Chris, for your um, for your comments. I think uh, you know thanks, they're very thanks, thoughtful. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. We, we ask them uh, to innovate, so we have to be open to innovation ourselves. But we're probably all yeah, over the place right now. <laughs> right? See you yeah, I know. I understand. I understand. I just I think some of the benefits of being in person are are pretty significant, and this is only the second one we've done in person after years of remote. So, <laughs> so we'll we'll see where this goes. But uh, but I'll continue to talk to group members about it and see where we're at. Certainly. We're all taking a break now.
Tommy Wright, welcome back. Now Jay Bright uh, will present the 2024 committee spring meeting recommendations. Thank you, Tommy. This is Jay Bright. Um, we'd like to again thank the members of the uh, Bureau for all their work in preparing for this meeting and to the advisory committee staff for helping things run very smoothly. Um, we appreciate the varied topics that were presented in this meeting, the um, very detailed and informative presentations, uh, the lively discussion, which helped shape the following observations and recommendations. A few things that came up during the course of our discussion are that some of these topics would be worthwhile for additional one-way briefings. Ideally, those would be in advance of CSAC meetings when we have technical content that we know we're going to be going through in detail or we're going to be seeing again. One-way briefings can be an effective mechanism for um, those kinds of topics and recognizing that that only makes sense if those are going to be subsequently discussed at an actual um, CSAC meeting where we can have formal discussion in a public setting because that's the way uh, CSAC operates. Um, but there were certainly a lot of rich and interesting topics during this meeting in particular. Um, so a few topics that came up as possibilities for one-way briefings in the future were the implementation of local differential privacy and the accompanying R package, um, which we're sure will come up again in future CSAC meetings, and some of the outlines of the technical details of the U.S. gridded data products. We wrote down a list of topics of interest for future CSAC presentations. Um, it's a fairly long list, and you can see it here, but these came up throughout the discussion. Uh, some of these are just topics of ongoing interest, and others came up specifically because of discussions at um, this particular meeting. Um, so going through the recommendations specifically, we've broken these into the usual sections. We don't have any general recommendations. They're all specific to a, a topic. Um, the first corresponding to the statistical product first production cycle. We've got a number of recommendations here. The first had to do with uh, monitoring the use of, its, of the data products that are generated through this process to better understand the needs of communities who do not engage directly with the Bureau. And one possibility there is to use AI-supported research procedures that could help identify this larger group. There's a recommendation that the Bureau maintain a list of high-priority, high-impact projects that are informed from and shaped by the data user engagements. We recommend that the Bureau compare the um, statistical product first guiding principles to the Federal Committee on Statistical Methodology Framework for Data Quality and consider expanding the guiding principles to explicitly cover data quality in all its dimensions, including things like coherence that aren't explicitly covered. We recommend that the Bureau formally evaluate SPF's user and data usage segmentation, give it its importance for effective outreach to data user communities, and we were very much interested in that segmentation. We we're very excited about that work. We recommend that Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders be treated separately from AIAN and the SPF demonstration product because these groups are treated differently under law. We recommend that the SPF initiative, sorry, I'm skipping one. Sorry, thanks, Barbara. <laughs> we recommend that the Bureau partner and engage with tribal nations um, beyond conferences where tribal leaders and policy experts may encounter urgent competing pol policy agendas with other agencies and departments, such as emergency management, economic development, and missing and murdered indigenous women. We can cons uh, consider more back and forth collaborations rather than presentations and listening sessions with limited tribal leader conversation. We recommend that the SPF initiative track and publicly report the communities that are served by data concierge services, as well as those that are not. And we, um, in tying into the open census initiative, we recommend that the SPS initiative provide preferred citations for all statistical and data products, as well as for open source co code products. We recommend the Bureau document the data governance principles associated with SPF, uh, such as its tiered access. And we recommend that the Bureau provide a detailed explanation of the process for determining the privacy loss budget for the IRS use case specifically. We recommend that the Bureau evaluate cryptographic approaches to improve the accuracy of the statistics computed in the IRS application and other cross-silo settings. 
And we recommend that the Bureau implement data governance principles such as accessibility and transparency by adding a short summary of data provenance and processing methods to each Bureau data product. For example, outlining the data sources for each variable, time reference, and the frequency of use of administrative and modeled records and responses. And this is in specific response to the idea that as you're combining different data sources and blending them, it really is essential to understand these provenance issues. Turning to the address frame maintenance of the future, we recommend that the Bureau continue targeted field activities for unique and hard to count addresses, including but not limited to hidden housing, tribal lands, Alaska, and Puerto Rico. And specifically, what we're saying is that we oppose completely eliminating field activities. We need that critically for ground truth and for some of these, um, for these unique and hard to count addresses. We recommend that the Bureau reconsider the interpretation of the um, local update of census addresses, LUCA, and the CQR declines and perform additional analyses on the LUCA and CQR to assess whether the patterns of decline are from inaccuracy in the addresses and the count or from limited resources, for example, time, people or technical expertise, software or funding, to update addresses for submission or count challenges. We recommend beginning LUCA earlier in the decade and enhancing outreach activities to engage tribes and smaller governments. This includes providing LUCA participants with tools, including, but not limited to, address standardizers and geocoders that output information in a format readily compatible with Bureau requirements, but also expertise, so actually on the ground expertise from the Census Bureau provided locally that will enable any new addresses to be added more readily to the master address file. We recommend that future iterations of the address count listing file include tallies that represent both the decennial census and ACS filters for each block to include the total number of housing units, basic street addresses, and group quarters facilities to assist local government's understanding of changes to their address counts in support of the LUCA program. And we recommend employing the LUCA program to identify hard to count areas, hidden housing units, multifamily buildings, and commercial addresses. We recommend compiling the number of non-city style street addresses by geography and comparing those results to MAF tabulations to target locations for infield address updates where major discrepancies occur. We recommend publishing quality metrics and assessments, so these are precision and recall, for identifying housing in different types of environments. So it's very different between urban and rural environments or heavily forested areas because these respond to geospatial imagery differently. Uh, we recommend expanding partnerships with tribal nations to better develop methodologies to identify addresses in tribal lands beyond reliance on the four tribal specialists because there are 574 federally recognized tribal nations, all the tribal areas, the state tribes, and it's particularly important for building partnerships across these politically diverse nations with different regulations surrounding types of data collection, for example, imagery of villages and different forms of housing units like Pueblos. Turning to the frames program, um, I should be saying on each of these, we found each of these topics to be extremely exciting and we were very much um, in favor of things we were hearing and um, there was just a lot of positive responses throughout and I'm just reading through the recommendations which might give a negative vibe but it's not intended to in any way. Um, CSAC recommends that the Bureau develop and share a roadmap of its plans to enhance frames and for how the value added by the frames per program hang on, uh, <clears throat> will be measured and evaluated. Um, we recommend that the Bureau prepare a working paper that describes improvements over the past decade in the person identification validation system and an updated report on pick rates based on the ACS and also other data sources. We recommend that the Bureau arrange to obtain from the Social Security Administration parental addresses from birth certificates in addition to parental names and create the Census Household Composition Key, the CHIC, based on assigning picks using both names and addresses. Improving links between children and their parents will improve the demographic frames coverage of young children, a group that's often undercounted. We recommend that the Bureau assess the strengths and weaknesses of household reconstruction by grouped MAF ID through comparisons of the reconstructed households with decennial census data, as well as selected national surveys such as the ACS. We, uh, the quality of the links among these various frames will depend on the degree to which the time periods mesh, and for this reason we recommend that the temporal references of the frames be carefully documented. 
We recommend that links among these various frames be examined, compared, and assessed to improve the information included in the individual frames and also to understand inclusion and exclusion of persons from the linked frames. We recommend removing any requirement that a person must have a MAF ID to be included in the demographic frame. And we were a little ambiguous on whether that was the case, but we recommend removing any such requirement if it exists. Um, we recommend that MAF IDs be included in the demographic frame as supplementary information associated with a person, so making this file wide. Um, for example, as a timestamp list with um, MAF IDs and corresponding dates for that person. And we recommend that the Bureau develop and share a plan for when and how products from and evaluations of the FRAMES program will be made available to users, including those participants in the Federal Statistical Research Data Centers. So turning to the continuous count study um, project, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a series of recommendations with a fair amount of technical detail, and I won't read every um, bullet, but um, there I'll kind of try to highlight the, um, the recommendations, the components of the recommendations. So these, this particular recommendation, number 30, has to do with linking the business frame and group quarters and continuous count study to modify the probability of those addresses, providing a correct geographical assignment of an individual's residential address. So I said I wouldn't read it. I just read the whole thing. Um, and then there's proposed research to determine which administrative record sources provide the greatest accuracy and then reflect that quality in the um, probabilities and provide information back to CSAC on the number of records added to the frames extract by each administrative record source. We have a recommendation that the continuous count study be employed to aid in understanding of state differences between the decennial and the PES in 2020. Um, and that the Bureau publish the results and explore the implementation of subsequent iterations of the continuous count study to enhance the 2030 uh, post-enumeration survey results. And we recommend that the Bureau provide a report to CSAC on the planned use of the 2020 decennial census results in future iterations. Um, I think we might have a typo here. Um, when those results will be available and if they will be included in the 2030 planning database. I worry that something got caught there, so we'll, we may have to revisit that one. Um, <clears throat> and again, a multi-part recommendation. This has to do with uh, quality improvements that could be explored, uh, including the production of confidence intervals for specific geographic areas and demographic characteristics, quality measures for additional age categories, especially for individuals under the age of 18, the creation of household-based models and comparing those results to the current person-based models, and assessing the impact of respondent information as proxy responses for other household members versus information that's been provided directly by the individual in current surveys and censuses and administrative records. Uh, the next is a multi-part recommendation having to do with enhancing data sources, including updating the MAF to link non-city-style -city address information to MAF IDs, um, determining the impact of adding other surveys, like the current population survey and the survey of income and program participation, and additional data from state or local sources, including providing incentives for those entities to participate. And one more, we recommend the Bureau expand and update its analyses of the adjusted measures for the continuous count, including comparing track level statistics to estimates produced by state partners in the federal state cooperative for population estimates, when such estimates are available, and producing estimates for municipalities and comparing those to the Bureau's sub-county population estimates. Turning to SIP, we have a series of recommendations, um, starting with a recommendation of comparing the advantage of, of starting each panel in January versus February. So one advantage of starting the panel, panel in February is making January rather than December the common month for all six rotation groups in odd number waves consistent with most SIP panels under the original design. And the presenters provided a rationale for having December, um, but we'd like to see a, um, an evaluation of the comparative advantage. We recommend that the Bureau explore whether the frames data and administrative records can provide housing unit level or at least small area level covariates that can be incorporated into unit non-response adjustments. We recommend that the Bureau incorporate administrative records to the extent possible in its expanded use of model-based imputation in the SIP. 
And we recommend that the Bureau's decisions on reordering sections and questions incorporate findings from cognitive testing as well as field tests. Um, we were asked specifically about um, what might be some alternatives to comparing the two designs for the same year, which would take a lot of time to wait for. And as an alternative, we recommend that the Bureau consider two complementary approaches and report back to CSAC. First, the Bureau could compare 2027 data collected under the current design and 2028 data collected under the new design to a third source for validation. For example, that might be administrative data for program participation and income. And second, the Bureau could directly compare estimates across the two years for other characteristics that can be presumed or ideally demonstrated from other sources to have minimal change from 2027 to 2028. The next recommendation is that the Bureau report back to CSAC, possibly in a one-way briefing or future CSAC meeting, on its findings regarding the quality of the synthetic estimates that would replace survey responses on the SIP public use files. And we recommend that the Bureau explore the proposed data integration approach to program participation and report back to CSAC on its findings. We were asked about what might, um, <clears throat> what might the program focus on, and we recommend that the Bureau focus on health insurance coverage dynamics, program participation rates based on sufficient information to simulate eligibility, and household and family composition dynamics. We recommend that the Bureau expand the brief annual report on wealth to include comparative analyses across subpopulations based on the extensive supplemental tables. And we recommend that the Bureau expand its SIP products to include reports on the topics that are listed as value adds in, in the text above, and expanded reports on topics that have been covered in previous reports, including income sources for older households, benefits received by veterans, number, timing, and duration of marriages, and parental presence among children. And reports on new topics, including child care arrangements, adult and child well-being, and income dynamics for low-income families. We also recommend that the Bureau release portions of its Python code that are likely to benefit SIP users. Finally, turning to grids for the U.S. Census Bureau, we recommend that the grids initiative collaborate with the SPF initiative and report back to CSAC on the potential for delivering statistical products for novel, geographically specific areas beyond existing Bureau geographies. For example, school districts, areas impacted or likely impacted by hazards, such as coastal communities, or populations within watersheds. We recommend that the Bureau work closely with the Disclosure Avoidance Team in order to determine data structures that may be needed to inform aspects of gridded output, such as spatial resolution, and the production, production of an uninhabited grid. We recommend that the Bureau produce variable resolution data products for the U.S. If using a latitude-longitude grid, these grids should be high resolution in urban areas, somewhat less fine in areas in the urban periphery, and it could be fairly coarse, perhaps even coarser than a kilometer when the population is sparse. So if the Bureau aims to produce a one kilometer grid as an initial data product, CSAC recommends also producing a grid no coarser than 250 meters for urban areas. Uh, we recommend that the Bureau produce a grid of land or surface area, and that would include water area, in each grid cell. And we recommend that the Bureau experiment with the use of geohashing or another modern method to translate latitude-longitude reference data into spatially flexible data products. And we want to emphasize that this would not preclude any sort of gridded output, including a one-kilometer grid. We also recommend that the Bureau explore the attribution of a z-coordinate in its grid system to represent altitudes or structure heights. This addition is important for the integration and use of data for and by other agencies such as the USDA, NOAA, FEMA, and others. Um, furthermore, this approach provides the capability for the Bureau to project 3D images of characteristics such as housing and population density. We recommend that the Bureau allow for users to define the geographic specificity, the extent and resolution of grids, depending on a set of requirements about the underlying data. So the data have to meet certain thresholds, and of course there are constraints. But testing would have to be done to compare top-down data products, such as those on the Bureau's geographic spine of nested regions, with user-generated gridded products. And we recommend that the Bureau compare estimates of spatial population counts from its new U.S. gridded products with the international grid statistical products applied to the U.S. So this is, take the two talks that we heard and uh, 
compare them directly on the U.S. for validation and ground truthing. In addition, comparisons should not only be with respect to the predictions themselves, but also with respect to differences in inputs, methodologies, and calibration techniques. We next recommend that the Bureau produce guidelines for the use of gridded data products, both those constructed for the U.S. and other countries. Um, that certainly most useful would be to include example programs, for example, in R or Python, for users on how to summarize gridded data into tabular data or use with other types of data. Uh, we recommend that the Bureau summarize and report back to CSAC on themes and temporal specifications that cannot easily be met by restricted data for the new U.S. gridded data products. And we recommend that the Bureau include Puerto Rico as a test case for its new gridded products, per, uh, producing perhaps prototype grids then for other locations and <clears throat> then providing those grids to FEMA and municipality authorities in Puerto Rico for feedback and potential use in planning before the next storm arrives. Um, those are our recommendations from the spring 2024 meeting, and our next step is to ask the committee members for a vote of approval of these recommendations. Um, so we've got um, all of us in attendance, plus Chris remotely, who can either, I can see you, Chris, so you can raise your hand, um, or you could use your hand icon if you prefer, but all in favor of approval of these recommendations from the spring 2024 okay. Meeting, would you please raise your hands? Chris's hand up, so that is uh, unanimous. And with that unanimous um, approval of these recommendations, um, I think I will hand it back to Tommy. Tommy Wright, thank you very much, Jay. I have four sentences. <laughs> please. First sentence, please note that the committee's next meeting is tentatively scheduled for September 19th and 20th, 2024. Thank you, committee, Jay and committee members, and safe travels back. Uh, this concludes the 2024 s committee spring meeting, and the meeting is now adjourned. Unless <laughs> someone has a last comment or anything. I, I probably should always, I should, probably should always allow that, so maybe they're fine. Um, um, oh, okay. Jay, I just thank you so much. You've been terrific. Thank you, Jay. Okay. This has been a marvelous meeting. Thank you, everyone, and look forward to the next one. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I don't. I, I lost count. I wonder. I wonder if there are things that could be like here are recommendations and we want responses versus here are some things to think about. You don't need to respond. Yeah. I, actually, during one of the breaks, I asked Shauna if she could go back to the 80s when I was on the committee just to see if there how many recommendations. I don't think we did as many. Of course, of course at that time, we had four different committees, ASA, the Economic, the uh, Population People, and the Marketing Association. But I don't, I don't know. Now, the NAC has always, that committee has always had tons of times. Go home. Get some rest. Get some rest. Hey, I have a